I just had a crazy flashback <laughs> about the letter C in a in a book about Sesame Street where Elmo was on a, a chocolate chip cookie boat and the cookie monster came and he was looking for the letter C. Wait, I need to find this. Your brain needs to be studied. <laughs> Are you high? No. I just Always. drank a lot of green Am tea. I feel like Billy's high. Are no, you no, no. high? <laughs> I just drank a lot of green tea. <laughs> PFT, I just applied for the GM role for part of my take. I love that. That would actually, that'd be very funny. Can I, is that something I can post? Yeah, it's funny. Uh, memes actually applied too. But as a joke. To this is also a joke. Oh, sure. Definitely. What if we hired you, Billy? Would you take the job? Would I have to move? No. But then I'll take it 100%. So it's not action. a joke. Yeah, I take it. And so you I, just confirmed it wasn't a joke right there. If you actually would give it to me, I'd 100% do it. And I'd. Are we recording this, Mad Dog? Okay, good. Just That's how we're going to yeah. start. Billy applied for the part of my take GM job as a, as a bit, but then completely seriously. Yeah. <laughs> what would your first order of operations be? Like, what would you do day one? Uh, just tell you guys laissez faire. So nothing. So yeah. <laughs> so you just said you just want a paycheck, and you just want to say, okay, the, I'm just not going to work. No, if you guys like actually wanted me to do stuff, I'd do it, but I wouldn't tell you to do anything. Okay. He will be at your service. I actually <laughs> think Billy. I think yeah, trying to be I, trying I to be the cool boss. I kind of want to hire you. There's no pay. <laughs> No, absolutely no pay. Like I just do it, just so you someone else doesn't do it and tell you to do things. Okay. All Is right. there a listed salary range for that position, Billy? Uh, I'll I'll be your representation. You're getting kind of ripped off here in this deal. <laughs> what I say, man, I, I, I'm 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 I wouldn't advise you to do this. All right. I mean, we'll we'll see what happens. We'll see after the resume gets in, but you know, who knows? Okay. I'll follow up with Hank for you. Mm. All right. Welcome back to Macrodosing. I did not quit this podcast, contrary to numerous false reports that were put out there by certain people last week. Um, I'm back, back in studio. We got Big T in Chicago, Mad Dog and McKenzie in Chicago. We're right now in the temporary Barstool office. Uh, I guess it's the old Barstool Chicago office. New one's being built. We should be there within a month or two. According to All Business Pete. Or three or four. Or three. Who knows? Uh, we got Aaron. We got Billy remotely. In my Big office. Di- in Billy's office, which is the macrodosing studio. It is August 10th, 810. All right, we're back. I missed you guys. I did miss you guys. I really did. My week wasn't the same without talking to you. I, I kind of missed you more. I haven't seen you in a long time. In, a, in almost a week. I think that's the longest. That we've ever been apart? Uh, not talking. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, this I long distance so. relationship with Billy. It's, I don't know if it's going to work out between us, Billy. Uh, I mean, there's a lot of people. There's a lot of bros walking around this office, and I'm looking at them, and <laughs> we're having some connections. We're having some moments. You know, I am but a man. I need bros. And man. you're not here broing me to my face. I'm going to get my bro job somewhere else. I think I'm, Nikki I'm gonna, Smokes might take over yeah. for, for Billy. Yeah, N- Nikki... It, it, Nikki would fill Billy's shoes nicely, I think. What? Yeah. Sorry, Billy. I'll fight him. I'll fight right. him. Rough and rowdies next Friday. Billy I'll beat wants the to shit fight out of him. If he looks at you, everybody. If he looks at you the wrong way, kick, Billy. You know that you've you yeah. promised ass kickings to like five different employees. I will dole out all five over the next five rough and rowdies. What That's we what should takes. do is, Billy, you should just be fighting five times, like a ladder. Like it's Mortal Kombat. You have to defeat five of your opponents. I think I could do five opponents and five of the opponents I talked about with no training. I think I could do it within in ten a ten day block. No, it's got to be one night. It has to be one night. 
If you gave me two months training, maybe. Who would you start with? Out of all the asses that you've that you've well, let's just go Max, Dana, and Nikki Smokes. Who would you start I, with? I'd start with Nikki Smokes. Okay. Uh then I'd go to Max and then I'd finish off with Dana. Wow. Oh, I, I don't know who that's disrespectful to, but it's disrespectful to somebody. Yeah. It's actually very it's disrespectful to Dana. And Max. It is. Well, I just I've never seen Nikki Smokes in person. He might he might be like, know how to box. All right. So if he honestly, it would be amazing. It would be good for his entrance if he just took some licks next Friday, rough and rowdy, the first rough and rowdy that's going to be streamed on YouTube. It would be a great way to kick off, like be a company man, and step in the ring, on YouTube, get a little little pay for getting what a little if he work. Kicked your ass. Good well, if he kicks my ass, then that's my fault. Billy, I think I could kick your ass if you put me third in that lineup. Sure. If you're if you've just done two fights, I think I could beat you. All right. I mean, hey, we'll have to get Devlin to set it up. Yeah, I'm not I'm not doing rough and rowdy unless it's my money on Billy. Oh. <laughs> I got my money on Billy. Okay. Billy can fight. Billy can fight. Oscar De La Hoya confirmed that. That was. That's such a wild he he sentence. Right, right, right hook. Yeah, you got him with the right hook <laughs> on the right. temple. <laughs> That's what. <laughs> but uh, how are you guys doing? How's Chicago? It's good. It's good. I'm going to Ireland this weekend. Going to Donnie's wedding. That's gonna be. That's gonna be a blast. I I've noticed that every time I I hang out with Donnie outside the country, it's always on a crazy long plane flight, and then I'm only there for two days. Donnie and I have to schedule a longer trip together somewhere because we went to Hong Kong. I was there for like 36 hours. I went to Qatar. I was there for like 48 hours, and now I'm going to Ireland, and I'm going to be there for like 40 hours. Just to be clear, not a vacation. It's not a vacation. Not a vacation in, fact, in Ireland. The destination wedding, not a vacation. I'm glad you brought that up, Big T, because it is an island, technically. Yeah, mm -hmm. so I'm, I'm. It is an island. Yeah. Taking a trip to the islands. Um, it's also a barstool event. So. Yeah. No, it's sponsored, not a vacation. So it's a work trip. It's not a vacation. Well. I'm trying to find a kilt somewhere here in Chicago because I want to wear a kilt to that uh, can't the golf be that hard. on Friday. Used We're, or new? Um, preferably used. I feel no, like new. I want a new kilt. <laughs> why, why, why would I want a used kilt? Because there's probably so many guys not using their kilts now this time of year. Like just walk into like any firehouse or police station. There's definitely a bagpiper who's like, yeah, use my kilt for this weekend. Yeah. It's not kilt season right now? It is not kilt season. I feel like summer would be the most kilt season that there is. It's hot. March. You get, March. You get the air flowing. Isn't that colder? No, but that's when St. Patrick's Why Day wouldn't is. you wear a kilt when it's hotter? I think actually... Oh. What, where do bagpipes I said it's play? I said this last podcast, but the, my only experience with Chicago was when I went there and they had the, the river... They, they turn the river green because it's St. Patrick's Day, so I'm sure you can find a kilt somewhere. There's yeah. a place called the Irish Shop in uh, Oak Park. Okay. If you want to venture out that way, I might. I might do it. I'm gonna. I'm gonna wear a kilt when I play golf on Friday with Donnie. Never worn a kilt before. Y'all playing golf? Like. Yeah, we're playing golf. I, I want to play golf in Ireland. I want to do that. That's like it's like the motherland of golf, ain't it? Uh, Scotland, I think. Or is that Scotland, Scotland Ireland? Aaron, if like, you went to Ireland to play golf, saying, would you classify did. that as a vacation? You said what? If you went to Ireland to play golf, what would you call that? A trip to Ireland? Okay. I'm not missing any work. Okay. Oh, good. you're trying to say he's on? What, what? Yeah, yeah, it's vacation. Why? Why? Why are you reluctant to say it's a vacation? It's not a vacation. It's a trip to Ireland for a wedding. Going, going to, to Ireland to play to like go to the motherland it's of a golf. Vacation? What? No, I'm 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 going to Ireland to help launch Donnie on his lifetime destination and voyage of love, and I'm being are there you to in support it? a friend. Are you in the wedding? I'm at the wedding. You ain't even in it. That's definitely a vacation, bro. <laughs> I'm at <laughs> the wedding. Just there. It's a trip of honor. Yeah. Listen, when your boy gets married, you wanna you wanna send him off with all the best wishes. You want to be there for him. 
I know, Aaron, you where. don't respect the parents. That's where. the thing. You're, you're a big... That, you're, whoa, whoa. You would Why be there, you come Aaron out? Would Why be you there come out of the corner be, with nothing but Because, I, because jazz, I, know your, I know your thoughts you about marriage. Out. You would be yeah. in the front row standing up being like, prenup. Prenup. I reject this marriage. Does well, anybody have a qualms? Well, hold on. No, I would never do that. I would be disrespectful to everybody there. Hold on. Let's get let's get this clear. Hold on. Let's get this clear. If my boy comes up and tells me I'm getting married, and I know my boy either has money or is going to get money, it is my responsibility as a man to tell that man, you better get a prenup. Because if we look at the stats, majority of marriages don't last. Maybe just under the majority, but I would say close to the majority of marriages don't last. And that's okay. You know what I'm saying? I believe I don't believe in the sanctity of marriage as far as like I don't believe like getting married under the God of that. That, that shit don't mean nothing to me. You're you're right. But if two people love each other, they want to spend their life with each other. I respect that and I respect that decision. You know what I mean? But if you go into Ireland and you just end the wedding, that's a vacation. I mean, if you just if you're not in the wedding, that's a vacation for you. It's okay to say that. See, I'm taking a vacation to Ireland. You deserve that. You work hard, man. Hardest working man in podcast, and I know. You know what, Aaron? You're right. I deserve it. This is what I'm talking about. Yeah. Saying Ireland's the motherland of golf is like saying Iraq caused 9-11 and then invading them. Whoa, Billy. That was like at least two minutes ago. That joke would have been, been, I've been <laughs> maybe mid two minutes I'm ago, trying, but now it's weak. I was trying to get it in. I got to work on the remote timing. It should, it should Billy, be weak. Billy's not wrong. Plus, I, I corrected myself. <laughs> So, I corrected yeah. myself. I said, I said, or is it Scott? Yeah, Scott, Scotland, St. Andrews, the birthplace of golf. Imagine how hard golf was. But back I think in Ireland the day. still got links. Uh, yeah. Yeah, same style. Yeah. But imagine I think they have yeah. a different game that wasn't golf exactly. What, Ireland? Yeah, I think like they're, they had another similar game. I mean, they weren't the first. Yeah, there's multiple civilizations that invented hitting a ball with a stick. Yeah. Like good hurling. activity. It's a great activity. As far as yeah. inventions go and like ways to pass time, I feel like hitting a ball with a stick is better than throwing a ball at a target. Well, lacrosse is lacrosse is pretty cool from that aspect, like hitting a ball with a stick, catching with a stick. Yeah. I would classify hockey also <laughs> as kind of a combo. You hit something with a stick. Well, baseball is the ultimate combo. It is throwing in hitting. Yeah, yeah, a little mm -hmm. bit of both. But um, the the first golfers that was probably hard as shit. Who knows what they made? Probably like feathers in some sort of sack, and then you hit it with a tree. That was probably pretty difficult to do. Probably a rock. Yeah, um, it was probably well, it, a rock and a hurling. It's kind of it's kind of wild how heralded sports are in general. If you just think about the object of the object of like each sport, it's kind of it's kind of wild. Like, there were many times in games where like we have like TV timeouts. And maybe I said this before, but like we had like TV timeouts, and so like you just kind of have to sit there and wait for the guy with the with the gloves to do his little hand gesture to say it's time to time to rock. There were like plenty of times I was just sitting there. I look up in the stands with 70,000 people. I'd be like, "Yo, they really just here to see us put a ball over a line." That shit is wild. <laughs> it's like, a 60, tribal thousand people watching this. Shit. <laughs> it's wild. I, I'm saying it's just, it's just wild when you, when you think about the object. Like I, I was playing golf the other day, and like I had a par four, and it was like four, you know, four hundred some yards. And I'm looking, I'm like, I'm really out here, on almost on the daily to put a fucking ball in a little cup. This shit is crazy. <laughs> no, it's fucking wild. No, there's a there's a good argument that like sports, especially in Europe, like prevent war. Like you know how much like ethnic <laughs> tension gets out from soccer games. It's pretty nuts. They also kind of start little mini wars, though. Yeah, but that's better than big ones. That's true. That's true. Only Aaron would actually like think that in the middle of an NFL game, like get real meta with it, an existential almost. I can't be the only one because it's it's weird. It's really weird. Like the intricacies of football is wild because you got you know coverages you got blitzes you got blitz pickups you got plays you have you understand know all kind of different things you can do on each play you forget the goal of the game is to get the ball over a line and it's just like an arbitrary thing too like if you ever notice like the inexact science of like marking a ball after somebody's down like so if somebody's down and they get a three-yard gain 
it's a ref that's like running from the side and it kind of like guesses where he believes the ball should be. It's a very inexact. So it's like it's like little kids playing. It is. We're just big ass grown men playing a little kid's game. It's that everybody enjoys. It's that's one of the unsung heroes of the NFL, by the way, is the guy with the orange mittens. That just his job is to stand on the field during a TV timeout. And then when he stands off the field, then the game's back on. <laughs> I want that job. <laughs> what is what, that what's, what sport do you guys think is the most ridiculous just in terms of thinking about it from um, like an, an outsider's point of view of like what the ultimate goal of it is? I like mean, an alien like watching simplistic. like, what the fuck are y'all like, doing? Um, I think the most pure sport is just... Mm track and field just sprinting that one makes yeah. the most sense right that makes sense i think that, combat sports yeah that, that is, makes that makes sense combat sports that makes is sense pretty. too though yeah i think those are those 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 all make sense boxing jujitsu wrestling like all that shit makes r- running against racing that makes sense because that's like the most primitive like i bet i could beat you bullshit line up like you know that mm-hmm. makes sense but then like Golf, golf is pretty wild. Golf is wild to think about. Hockey, um, that makes sense wild. too. Though you're on, you're on sharpened knives, gliding across frozen water, and you got a big ass <laughs> stick, and you're trying to hit a little, <laughs> a little donut into a net. Equestrian, yeah, like the ride, riding a horse. Is that, yeah, like an equestrian, bipedal bipedal creature rides quadrupedal creature to jump over weird things and walk a certain way yeah i think it's fucked up and also makes sense to award gold medals to the the jockeys those medals should go to the horse that's why i said i think the sport that would be easiest to (laughs) become uh like to do in itself would be equestrian just because you just ride a horse and let the horse do the work. I think there's a little bit more to it than that. No. But, but the horses yeah. should you, get the... It's about training the back. horse. You have to you have to spend a lot of time. Them motherfuckers get treated like royalty, except when they break a leg or something, then it's just whatever. But I'll pow. Um, that one makes sense too, though, because like we, we evolved with horses and stuff to you know meander on through the, the terrain. That, that makes sense too. I'm talking about the like the random with like hockey like the first the first couple couple cats to play hockey that 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 had to be a sight to see. Yeah, there's a lot of firsts that are wild. I think I said this too before. Like the first nigga to try milk. Yeah, that's a weird. <laughs> that's a weird. That's a weird dude. That's a, that's no, a that weird dude, dude man. That and dude's... It's not even him actually. It's not even him that's that weird. He he he, had, he adventures, but it's the second nigga. You know what I'm saying? Like the second cat to try milk. He had to, he had to get it from his home. He's like, hey, yo, come here, come check this out. And he's like, yo, <laughs> suck on this. And the second dude had to be like, hey, yo, what? Well, yeah, I think he did that starvation. Shit. I think the whole idea of starvation sort of really changes a lot of minds. Because like, if you see like a little calf sucking on some milk, and you have some sort of conception of what milk is, because babies suck on milk, and you're starving, you're gonna go walk up to that buffalo and pray that it thinks you're it's calf. And you're suckling because you're about to die in the still forest. Wild. It's still wild. <laughs> yeah, the first wild. there's probably a lot of sickos out there that'll try drinking anything out of an animal. And so it's not surprising that one person would try it. But for that person to find another dude that was like, Yeah, yeah, I'm into that too. Let's do this together. <laughs> just, and then they would just sneak off to their village and just, just suck off suck cow. on cows others yeah but they had this like secret thing <laughs> yeah it was probably it probably was a, sh- a shameful activity broke back farm <laughs> <laughs> um hey speaking of sports with with balls i got a question for big t big t what color is a tennis ball big t yellow is do it? you do you think a tennis ball is green so i saw that you wrote a blog about it what was the premise of this? Uh, uh, there was a somebody did put a poll on Twitter. It said, "What color is a tennis ball?" And it was like forty six percent to forty three. And then there was a couple other options, like just show the answer, or whatever. And I I can't believe that there are people who think a tennis ball is green. What the official name of the color? I think is optic yellow. Is that what it is? I think so. I think they start yellow, but the dirt that gets on them makes them green. So it depends how old it is. Yeah. 
Billy, what color is the spaceship on your hat right now? The macrodosing logo. Fluorescent green. Yeah, that's kind of that logo is kind of a tennis ball color. That's isn't it? not close to a tennis ball. Look at wait, this. wait, what? What's look at this and then look at his hat. Closer to a tennis ball color. This C four shaker this bottle. C four by a lot. No, wait. I, what am I looking at? The way I explained it was. Watch Wimbledon. They're playing on green courts. Can you see the ball? Yes, mm -hmm. because it's yellow. But there's shades too. It's not. It's yellow. What well, color is the spectrum? Color is the spectrum. So it's, it's yes. Yeah, like, so it's really an like oversimplification. Like but wet wet tennis balls are green. Like tennis balls your dog plays with are green. Hmm. Oh, that's like saying if you get a white shirt dirty, then it's brown. But like. I think tennis balls turn green more often than not. This new tennis ball I'm looking at, pretty yellow. But the old tennis ball that you play with on the, the public courts is green. So, like, if you look at Billy's screen, right, that that drink cup is yellow, and then C4. our logo is green. And so it's no free ads, bro. How many times do you got to tell you that shit? Anyway. The cup is yellow. Did, did they, or did they, they pay us? I don't know. I don't yeah, know. Yeah, C4 pays the us. The green shit is... Uh, okay, bet. Well, then, yeah, it's a C4 cup. But the, but the green shit is our logo. And it's like it's like this fading... It, it could be either. I could, I could see both arguments. I just... I genuinely never heard somebody refer to a tennis ball as green before. So according to the ITF... I'm assuming that's the International Tennis Federation. I'm not going to look that up. Most balls are <laughs> produced as a fluorescent yellow known as optic yellow. First introduced in 1972 following research demonstrating they were more visible on television. So, yeah, yellow. They're yellow. Good call, Big T. I just genuinely, like, never heard that. That people think it's green? Yeah. I still, I still it's greenish. Green. I've heard the debate on Gatorade, lemon lime Gatorade. Yeah, I'm not. Listen, I if you want to say that tennis balls are green, I'm not going to lose any sleep over it. It's not blatantly obvious to me that they're yellow. I would say it's blatantly. Would Would you say that lemon lime Gatorade is yellow or green? Lemon lime Gatorade is yellow. See, that's, that's very yellow. interesting to me because I would say those are the same color. Because lemon comes first in it. That's I think that's crazy. It just incepted me into it. If you you mean if you put a tennis ball and a lemon lime Gatorade together, you go you see the same color. I'd have to look at it again, but I think they're very similar. There's no I, there's no way you see the same color. I think it depends on if it's in the shade or not. Yeah, that's about the color of a tennis ball. That's crazy. Nah, like I would say those yellow softballs, that is a more of a yellow than yeah. a tennis ball. I agree with that. Yeah. Dogs can't tell the difference. Ever think about that? Is that their type of color blindness? I think so. I don't know. I don't know what, what dogs see. Yeah. Um, Mad Dog is dog sitting for me this weekend while I'm in Ireland. I am. She's looking after Blake. Mm -hmm. I met Blake this weekend. Yeah. Good, he's, good boy. He's a good boy. I need to come up with some a list of rules for Mad Dog, which he's not allowed to do in my house while she while she pet sits. You said I could, I could throw a high school party. You could throw a high school party, yeah. Well, high, high school style party. Yeah. Yeah, I don't have high school friends here. Like high school house party. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Can I get a keg? That's not a good idea. Yeah. At all. Well, you can put one hole in the wall. Okay. And um, you're allowed to order one movie on pay-per-view. Two movies. Two movies on pay-per-view. Wow. Okay. <laughs> Big spender. Big spender. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. I got that I got that two two movie budget going. Okay, that, that works for me. That's I would it. say parties only outside. No, inside's fine. Yeah. I'll just do one of the floors. I'll keep it exclusive to one floor. There we go. Or you can have each floor be a different level. Different party on each yeah, floor. Yeah, you can do like an around the world party. Mm -hmm. So... Okay. So the basement is Australia. Okay. The main floor is going to be, let's say, France. So it's wine and girl dinner. And then <laughs> okay. uh, second North floor Pole. upstairs. What's that, Billy? North Pole Santa party. Yeah, polar bear party on the roof on the roof deck. Okay. All right, sick. Um, so that's going to be fun. Try not to break everything. I'll try. 
Uh, what else we got today? We, today, we're going to talk about the Industrial Revolution. We've got a great guest, actually a, a fascinating conversation with this guy, Brian Merchant, and he's going to talk to us about the Luddite movement and how it relates to artificial intelligence today and uh, and some things that they did back in the back in the day in the 1700s, 1800s, and how that might impact what's going on with AI coming up. Do you guys know, by the way, the difference between AI and just software? Because I feel like AI is just used as a, a catch-all term. Like people want to sound buzzy when they're talking about, but what they're really describing is just like advanced forms of software. Yes, but like software, someone has coded it, and that's all it can do. So it's like more specific. I feel like, and then AI is more sentience. The wrong word, but that's the only word I can think. So of. it's being coded to be able to absorb new things that aren't in like the original parameters of what the software was originally yeah, is that like, right i think i think software is like okay you know twitter like twitter is coded with software got it but okay. like ai is you know it can make new things from the code that I don't know, like isn't it like programmed has? to like like problem solve like it can problem solve yeah that's like the ai is just like advanced software i guess got it um i have a question for billy or Bill, mm -hmm. you can you can look this up and get the answer for us. Jamie, pull this up. Okay. Uh, at the start of the Industrial Revolution, people started to use like typewriters, right? Typewriters became a big thing. Why is a typewriter formatted in the QWERTY format? Q W E R T Y across the top. Does anybody know? Oh, I know this for a fact. It's the least least used uh, next to the most used, so that the, they wouldn't get stuck down from. Like the alphabet has a lot of vowels next to each other that tend to get used more. So they used to get stuck down. So like the W, R, and D aren't as used as much as E. So that's why they're around E. But it was just this most strategic way to make sure that all the uh, buttons didn't get messed up because of the alphabetical order. Is that true? Well, I'm Maybe. looking at the keyboard now. I would say, so like A is next to S. Those are very commonly used. But A is used way more than S. R is next to T and E. I and O are next to each other. And U. Billy, there are three vowels in a row on the keyboard. M and N are next to each other. I'd say but those are very used common consonants. Yep. Billy, fact check yourself. Now let me fact check myself. Okay, the name comes from the order of the six keys was devised in 1870s by Christopher Latham Scholes, a newspaper editor and printer. Scholes held a patent, patent application. Uh, it was Billy. a lot of trial and error rearrangements of the original machine's alphabetical key arrangements. The study of letter pair frequency by educator. Oh, I think I'm wrong. Uh oh, he's halfway right. I think the the it was were the letters that would be most usually used in the preceding letter. So E is used a lot with R, but why is in Q next to U? This says the arrangement was intended to reduce the jamming of type bars as they move to strike ink on paper, separating certain letters from each other on the keyboard, reduce the amount of jamming. So I yeah. don't know that it's necessarily the most used or whatever, but it was for that. So we're playing, yeah, to stop we're playing the on a set of rules that was developed 150 years ago but for now, a problem that we don't have anymore. But now you can't change keyboards. it now. How how bad would that fuck everything up? Be well, horrible. I think that's, you know what? Okay. If, uh, if I'm, if I'm trying to compete with Apple right now, if I'm a rival computer maker, um, I'm going to do my own keyboard. Well, when like, if you're signing into apps on your TV or whatever, sometimes to put in your password, it'll be an alphabetical keyboard and those suck. Those do suck. There's got to be a better way, though. I don't hate those, though. I actually, I think that makes more sense than this shit, in my opinion. It does. I think we just learned the... on this, so it makes sense to you. But like, correct. I, I, did, if... I was never good in computer class. I was always ditched. So I was a. I used to type like that, like a little chicken pecker, right? And so I know exactly where R is relative to Q or S when it comes to the alphabet. You know the alphabet better than you do the keyboard. Well, yeah, do. but like but sometimes it's touch. a different number of letters in the row and mm -hmm. you like you're you're used to the QWERTY keyboard and you know where everything is right now. If it had always been alphabetical, yeah, that would make more sense. 
it's more intuitive but i think it's a generational thing too because like i think computer class just started with our generation and i didn't pay much attention to it um so like i'm not one of those you know look to the side and type type cats uh so when i see a alphabet in a row that makes i'm, I'm better with that i don't know but uh y'all want to know the top 10 letters used according to readers address readers can i guess yeah guess the first one first one gotta be e First one is E. Let's well go. Done. Let's see. I Let's said see. that before. Number two, I, I'm guess is, I'm going to guess. Yes, Billy, you did. <laughs> what? See, Billy just took credit for your guess. Did he? Wait, yeah, what he did he say? Because Billy before. said that uh, like earlier when I was getting my fact wrong, I said at one point. Well, my fact e was right, was but like I, I had trouble reading the Wikipedia. Okay. Uh, number two, I'm going to go Why don't you let Big T get a shine though, eh? That is number two as well. Okay. Good Big shit. T is okay. on fire. Number three, three I'm going to throw a consonant in crazy. there. I'm going to guess S is number three. Mm, I, I see where you went, but it's uh, it's R. Okay. Uh, is S four? Nope. Four is T. I. Okay. All right. I'm done guessing. Five is O. Okay, mm -hmm. five is O, six is T, seven is N. That's actually surprising to me. Whoa. Eight is S, nine is L, and ten is C. C, uh, C, good. There you go. That that's an interesting letter sneaking in the top ten. Yeah, that's um kind of an outlier. What would you put N in was above C? Well, you didn't well, say M, did you? M wasn't in there. Mm -mm. M that's shocking. In there. C that over shocking. M. That's yeah. That's a sixteen over one. That's why we. That's why we play the games. Yep. Not played on <laughs> I just, paper. I just had a crazy flashback <laughs> about the letter C in a in a book about Sesame Street, where Elmo was on a, a chocolate chip cookie boat, and the Cookie Monster came, and he was looking for the letter C. Wait, I need to find this. Your brain needs to be studied. <laughs> Are you high? No. I just Always. drank a lot of green Am tea. I, like, I feel like Billy's high. Are no, you no, no. high? <laughs> I just drank a lot of green tea. <laughs> Letter C, Sesame Street book. Um, yeah, C, C's a shocker to sneak up there. I just feel like there's a way that we could rearrange the keyboard. We've been doing it this way for so long. I think that we only use it this way because it's what we're used to. There's got to be more efficient way. What about just a keyboard with words on it? So you don't even have to fuck with the letters. Explain. Oh, okay. So, um, Big T, your keyboard would have like the word Tennessee on it. Okay. That you could just smash. That has um, multiple double letters in it. No, I know, but I'm saying you don't have to type out the entire word. You just hit the Tennessee button, then you get the word. Okay. It's like autocomplete, okay. right? Okay. When you pull up your phone and you can autocomplete. The I have sentence. that turned off because I hate that shit. But... Yeah, but you know what I'm saying? Like you just hit. Yeah, I'm just confused as to. How many letters would be on your keyboard, or how many? How many words? It yeah, would, I don't know. Maybe your top twenty-six words would be on there, and then you oh. have the other keyboard underneath. So it's like a hybrid. You can go back and forth. Okay. Yeah, <clears throat> sure. Have you guys ever seen a court stenographer's keyboard? No. Yeah. Oh, you haven't? No. Oh, it's yeah, very. They has. They have. That's exactly what they have. I mean, I think that was Frank's job before Barstool. He just it's like hieroglyphics, though. There's no chance. I've seen Frank's tweets. He was not a court stenographer. No, no, no but he you worked just in a press, court house. I don't think it's. I don't know what the exact word for it is, but it's the person that types down what everyone says in the courtroom. But okay. they have a really weird, weird, weird keyboard. Well, some of them also have the mask on, so they just repeat what they hear, and then it's, it's text <clears throat> yeah. to court stenographer to text. keyboard, and it's, it's like weird. six buttons. How do you court? Yeah. Yeah, I've never seen this before. A That's stenograph, wild. a keyboard with only 22 keys. The keys on the left are used to type the first si letter of a syllable of a word, and the keys on the right are used for the last letter of a syllable. And vowel, vowel keys are on the bottom row. Okay, so they don't have full words, but they have like stenotype. That makes sense because like PH and TH are, are frequently used together, all the vowels at the bottom. That makes sense. That's wild. I kind of want to get a court yeah. stenographer keyboard. 
I mean, then you could really just type how you talk. It goes S T P H instead of QWERTY. And then on the other side, instead of U I O P it's F P L T D. That's This is breaking my brain. Actually. I'm, I'm kind of <clears throat> arguing against myself. I like the QWERTY keyboard now. Does it fill in the letters that's in between the vowels? I don't know. We have to have a court stenographer that listens to the show, right? Yeah. Let us know. Frank might be a court stenographer. I bet you $100,000 he was not a court stenographer. What did he do? With the, okay. Take that bet. Take that bet. How much did he say? Wait, does 100000 What does Billy have to give, give you? Cause... Give him some odds. Give him some yeah, odds. Yeah, yeah, give him some odds. Billy owes me $2,000 if he's wrong. Deal. De that's that's th the expected value is in your favor. <laughs> Even if you yeah. lose, I'm taking I'm taking that bet. I don't have. You know what? Fuck. You want to do what, that bet with me? One, one I don't second. even know this nigga. Who what are you doing, Billy? <laughs> Take this bet. No, no, I'm just, no Bill, I'm, Billy, you can't look it up. No, I was gonna just look at my savings account. And okay, I'll do it. I'll do it. I'll do it. I'll do that shit. Okay, all right. I'll Let's, do it. Go. Call, Let's go. Let's go. It's a bet. to bring him in. Love to see yes. it. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Bring Frank in. Okay. Let me grab Frank. Wait. Wait. Billy, you're gonna lie to him. We want Billy to bring him in. Wait. wait no, 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 yeah, no, no, no. Billy. No. 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 Hang on. I gotta call Frank. Too late. <laughs> What's it? Is this Frank's number? Bro, he's gonna tell Frank he'll give him five grand. Five. No, Billy, Over a hundred. Shit. No, that's what Billy will tell him. Ball. Hey, I'll win a hundred grand if you say you were a court stenographer. I'll give you five. Just come in and say it. Billy, damn oh, Billy, that was a mistake bet. on my part by allowing Billy to go get him. Yeah, the whole thing's been compromised now. It has shit, 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 shit. I gotta get his number. I've just I DM with Frank. I think most people communicate with him by DM. He's smiling his ass off because he told him. Frank's gone missing and it has something to do with him needing his glucose. But when I said that to everybody outside, they're like, that sounds right. <laughs> because they've just heard the word courthouse. If he's did any stenography, does it count? No, what his his job title. What happens if you actually have to give me a hundred thousand dollars. Nothing. It's a drop in the bucket. I love that we can do this now. Yeah. All right. I'll update you and Frank the Tank text me back. I just text him, ask him a simple question. What was your job title when you worked at the court? Billy thinks you were a stenographer. I think that you were a clerk. That's the text that I sent him. And uh, Big T, you can verify that. Oh, you never said you thought he was a clerk. I, I did say that. Yeah, you probably won. That yep, probably that, makes that's way what more I sense. As well. Okay. All right, so we're going to get into the industrial revolution. Anyone? Anything else we want to talk about? Big T, you were. I, I missed out on some of the show last week. You were teed off about some pretty significant stuff, right? Significant. I'm, I'm assuming that you've got. You already got into all that. He's yeah, transphobic. Yeah. What, there's an I in there. Trains. Yeah, you don't like trains. <laughs> I don't like the train that goes by my house. Okay, that's fair. Yeah, <laughs> that's fair. We Other trains train I'm TBD shirts. on, but uh -huh. you're not in my backyard for trains. Yes, I am a train <laughs> NIMBY. Correct. This is you're standing between uh, national light speed rail. People like you. No, 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 no. That would be a good train. No, but if this that is train, a bad train that train has to go through someone's backyard, and your train's phobia is part of the problem. Well, just make it quiet. Yeah, there should be quieter trains. Yeah. It's just figure out a way to move hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of tons of steel and metal quietly, please. Well, no, it's not the, the movement of the train. It's the bell. Oh, yeah. I, I saw Arian's tweet about how uh, he, he's convinced that train conductors, they pull the horn when they yeah, go past the golf course. They said they do. They said they do. Yeah, that's a good that's a good prank, though. I don't mind. I think it's funny because I, I live right by a golf course and there's I think it's like whole, I don't know, 13, 12, where I got to pull out and go to the highway on to get to the city. And every time somebody's in the backswing, I always, I always honk the horn. I do the same shit. So I ain't mad at them. I just think they just do it, but they don't do it like in people's backswings. They just sit there and blow the horn for 20 minutes straight. And I'm like, all right, dog. But have you get your kicks? I used to do that when I drove past the golf course too. Like when I was 16, that was, that was the best when you got your car. 
is right in the backswing, just fucking people. Mm hmm. I still do it, and I'm 36. Yeah. Um, all right. Anything else we want to get into? Big T, you teed off about anything this week? Not other than the trains, no. Still on trains. Anybody else? PFT, were you disappointed in how the women's soccer team ended? Yeah, I thought that they underperformed. The world's kind of caught up to us, but our, our team didn't. If you watched any of the games, they never looked like they were out, out there asserting themselves. They were playing passively for the most part. I mean, they did outplay Sweden in the last game, but they just they didn't score. Um, it was unfortunate, but yeah, we're not. It's we expect more from our women. Did you That's did you guys get into about. this? Yeah, I didn't like uh, how Billy, Megan Rapinoe smiled. Really at, I think that's yeah. I mean, it it wasn't a good look, for sure. But it's not about her. She shouldn't have been playing. I actually blame. I don't necessarily blame Megan Rapinoe. I blame the manager of the team for having her on that roster, because she's so far over the hill right now. She should not. She took a roster spot away from a much better player that could have been out there, actually contributing. Because if you watched her over the course of the tournament. She did not do anything worthy of having that roster spot. And it sucked that Rose Lavelle was out for that game because she's way, way better than Rapino. They kind of play different positions. But it's still like I Yes, Megan Rapino should have made her penalty kick, obviously, but she shouldn't have been out there in the first place. That's my opinion on it. But, Billy's got the smile on his Billy, face. Billy like was there's mad something he wants to say. So I was I was uh I was at the PLL in Baltimore enjoying amazing lacrosse from the bar down beer garden uh they uh only sold craft beers which have much much higher percentages than dukes and i are used to uh and after that it sounds like an excuse just built i had to the pre-story okay i didn't talk about this on on monday but i had a drunk tweet that went a little too viral that uh i kind of want to explain uh i said that meg rapino should be deported uh i i take that back I take that back. Don't think she should be deported. At the time I did, I don't currently think that. But it was do doing so many numbers. And now that Elon's paying people for Twitter, I, I had to let it go. I had to let it just run its course. So I apologize. Hell Are you did. still on this thing where you're trying to get paid to tweet? I am getting paid to tweet. Oh, yeah. I got, you, I just got paid. How much? I got With 200 check bucks. Hit With a check hit like. That check hit like 200 did bucks. Did you seriously? Yeah, dude, I'll send you the, the image. That's so, kind of insane, actually. So, Bill, you were you were playing a long game on this one. You didn't. You don't actually think that she should be reported. No, at the time when I tweeted it, I saw that shit and I was like, "What the fuck?" Like the porter. Yeah. yeah, I mean, she she fucked up. That was a, it was a bad penalty. But I would have said that about LeBron. I would have said that about like if I was watching the 2004 Athens games and the basketball team didn't win the whole thing. I'd be like, what the fuck? It's it's yeah. definitely an overstatement. No, I mean, listen. The hockey the US, team? The U.S. women's national team is historically a dominant organization, yeah. right? They're really, really good. They've become more and more a focal point for, like, the culture war that everything is about nowadays, which sucks. I hate that you can't just commentate on something and be talking about the sport, and then all of a sudden you're thrown into, okay, well, you believe this because you subscribe to this political point of view. They sucked this World Cup. Just straight up from a sports perspective, they were not good. They were disappointing. They should be better than that. They had – Megan Rapinoe had a terrible World Cup. We got to get better, but maybe maybe this is uh, – maybe this lights the fire. Who knows? It's tough to win three World Cups in a row. That is weird, too, because if you win two in a row, it's hard to say to the people that, that got you there. Um, well, oh, wait. Frank's calling me back. Hey, Frank. <laughs> it's PFT. Hey. Yeah, you tried to call me? I did try to call you. Yeah, this is PFT. And uh, we're taping macro dosing now, so just so you know, we're recording this. But uh, Billy and I were talking about keyboards and about the different keyboards that you use for different jobs. Billy thought that you were a court stenographer. Were you a court stenographer? What was your job title when you worked at the court? I was a court clerk. Okay. Uh, fuck, fuck, stenographers fuck. Uh, basically are being done away with. So I actually recorded the uh, court proceedings on a digital... Uh, digital recording and I would have to log who was talking. Did Got you it. ever did you ever did he ever B use a stenographer thing? 
but your your job title was, was did you clerk, ever use right? a stenographer you, you weren't you weren't actually writing down the dialogue and all that stuff no i was just cataloging uh who was testifying at the moment or who was uh who the proceeding was so they could actually go and listen to it later got it okay i was so goddamn all right close. i knew he was thank you frank hanging out what they're saying yep take care Okay, right. so I'm going to say something here. Billy owes me $2,000. Frank the Tank, <laughs> at, at some point in his job, he was typing things into a computer that people would then read in conjunction with reading the dialogue from the court proceedings. I'm willing to say that that's close enough where you now only owe me $1,000. Deal. Okay, awesome. Deal. Deal. All right. Good. Fuck yeah. Billy, that was close enough that Better man the, than me. the potential return was still worth that. Can I can I pay pay that over time? Yeah, maybe two hundred bucks a month. I'm gonna need more viral tweets out of you, Billy. That, he's waiting on Twitter. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Billy, just start stealing <laughs> stealing tweets left and I'm right. Just, I'm just gonna try to go viral so goddamn hard. Rex Chapman. Yeah. Yeah, yeah Billy, I need you to be the blocker charge. I'm I'm literally gonna just start ripping <laughs> like the craziest videos from Reddit that I usually no try to don't, no Billy your instincts are no you okay. you're saying that you want to tweet out more like animal murder videos they do numbers I would say that you just got to tweet out you got to figure murder. out your own block or charge do you think you're do you think you're tougher than the fucking sun the sun yeah, <laughs> yeah need you to go viral Billy. Um, all right. Well, that that demystifies that. What were we talking about before Frank called me back? Oh, yeah, the women's national team. Yeah. Anyways, don't deport them. They're welcome to come back. But it's hard to win three World Cups in a row. Where is she from? Megan Rapino. No, mm -hmm. she's from America. It, it was stupid. It was stupid. It was a very stupid tweet. So we're going to ask what, what you that's, that's I'm going to unfollow you if you just try to go viral for, 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 tw <laughs> for tweets. To get money, but I promise I'll unfollow you. Okay. I've heard some people calling her a loser. Well, get she's your not, money, man. Objectively speaking, she's not a loser. She's one of the best women soccer players of all time. But in this tournament, she absolutely played like a loser. This residual, this residual hate from her taking a knee during the national anthem. Promise. They just wait. They was waiting to pounce. They was waiting. Mm -hmm. Aaron, when you were when you were playing towards the end of your career, was there a moment where you realized like, hey, I don't. I don't have it like that anymore. No, I, I thought I thought I could play pretty well. I was just battling like little small injuries towards the end. So I walked out. I was like tip top shape, like as far as like agility wise. I didn't I didn't feel that in my career. Um, there was a point in time where I remember like the recovery time is taking long. Like whereas I'd be good like maybe Wednesday. Tuesday, Wednesday, like later on in my career, I could feel it. Like I would feel that shit all the Friday and sometimes in the Saturday. But you never had a moment where you're like, uh, I, I really shouldn't be out here anymore. Like games pass me by. No, no, I was only 30. I walked away at 30. Cause I feel like Rapino, she's 38. That's pretty old. That's pretty old for a soccer player, regardless of your gender or whatever. It's, um, it's a, a young woman's game. So, we got to reload. That's fine. We got some young players coming up. I do like watching the women's game at some points more than I like watching the men's game um, for reasons that we've talked about. They don't flop as mm -hmm. much. They seem like they're just tougher. They seem like, I don't know. There's more the there's more spacing in the game. So it's unfortunate that they're not moving on. But uh, Megan Rapino is allowed to stay in the United States, according to Billy's new take. Mm -hmm. Is she a hero, Billy? Sure. Wow. Okay. Soft. She's done a lot for women's soccer. <laughs> she has. She has. All right. Uh, anything else we want to get into before we talk about the Industrial Revolution? Going once, going twice. Do you All want right. to talk? Do you want to talk about Barstool being bought back? So yeah, we can talk about the the Penn Barstool, ESPN thing, Penn National Gaming, Penn Entertainment. Excuse me. Um, sold Barstool back to Dave. Penn is now doing a business deal with ESPN to launch ESPN bet 
and that's going to be coming forward in the next like couple months. I think it's good for all three companies probably. ESPN gets some money from Penn. Penn gets to work with ESPN and their national platform that they have um, to to work on uh, on gambling, and they don't have to work about regu- worry about regulators um, that might not have liked Barstool. We don't have to worry about it from Barstool's perspective when it comes to the regulators. So now we're running our own ship again. And uh, I think it's going to be, it's going to be good for this podcast. Definitely. Because um, regulators don't like content about drugs, sex. The name of our podcast is macro dosing. Um, so I think overall that's, it's, it's probably good. It's probably good for us and nothing's going to change. So that's, that's pretty much it from my perspective. So we're about to get a whole lot crazier. Yeah. Our takes, are. everything. Well, this is the only place that you can come for Billy football now. Yeah. Unless he gets the Unleashed. part of my take GM. Yeah. I but that doesn't that's not a speaking role, so are there any takes, Billy, that you've been you've been saving that might be too hot for TV that now you're you're off the leash? Uh Aaron Rodgers has been unjustly crucified for years for being a really nice guy. For like he hard knocks just showed he was just he's just an amazing dude. Like how he treated Lee Schreiber, uh, Ray Donovan, when he showed up, he was just like, yo, that dude's lonely. Go comfort the Hollywood bro who may seem like he's a cool actor and everything, but really he has no idea what he's doing at this practice and he's probably tweaking out. Yeah. And he's so- like so nice to the young guys. I think the hard knocks was it was too, it's it's an it was really awesome to see as a Jets fans, but at the same time, it's like it's like unrealistic pornography for what's actually going to happen. Like yeah, teenage I mean, boys watching porn, me watching hard knocks, unrealistic expectations. It's um, every year in hard knocks, it, it you find yourself thinking this team could be really good. It's very rare that on hard knocks, you get a team that a lot of people think could be great, like the best team in the NFL. And so your expectations are going to be so far raised I don't. I don't want to like damper any of this childhood like ex- excitement you have, Billy, because it's good. Um, but just try to try to temper the expectations just a little bit. They said it to Ed Sheeran. They what said they say? all of his insane throws to Ed Sheeran. That's just that's not a that's that's almost cruel in how awesome it is. Yeah, um, Zach Wilson looked good too, right? Yeah, no look passes. Aaron Rodgers also think his ceiling is way higher. Okay, um, hmm. maybe I'm old fashioned, and I mean I never played the game at a high level, unlike you, Arian, and you also, Billy. Uh, but typically, you'd like to see your quarterback looking where he's passing the ball, right? Maybe that's Zach Wilson's problem. He's just always been <laughs> throwing no look passes. If the receivers know it's coming, that's the only problem. Yeah, I would like my quarterback to look at the receivers. Maybe that's just me. But you should know where they are before the ball snapped. All right. So, Billy, before this episode aired, what were your expectations record wise? Uh, 10 and 7. And now? You think, wait, you were only thinking 10 and 7? Well, like, I was being realistic. That was my realistic expectation in my head. Okay. That might 13, not even make the playoffs in the AFC. 13 and 4. 13 and 4. And Super Bowl? Yes. We're thinking Soupy? Thinking it. He did look happy, but again, we only see what they allow us to see in that, which is like 15 minutes of Aaron Rodgers. But he did look like a nice guy, so good for him. Um, Oh, Big T, there was one other thing. Uh, Joe Milton said that he could throw a football 90 yards. Yeah. That fucking rocks. He's going to be so awesome. Show me the video. I want to see the video of him throwing the ball 90 yards. You've seen like, him throw an orange 120. Mm-hmm. That's not a football. Show me the football. Stop I mean, teasing there's me. Video of him throwing it like 70 in a game. So I'm I have no trouble believing he can throw at 90. Yeah, but we've seen a couple guys throw at 70. I want to see him throw a 90. I mean, they have to run a play where he tries to throw the ball 90 yards, right? Well, sometimes that's just any play. Yeah, <laughs> that's just a, a play that's called, and then he decides he's going to do that. That's just Bazooka Joe, baby. Yeah. Like uh, 90 yards. Him, <laughs> like that guy can hail Mary from the 20. 
Yeah. I want to see it. I want to see all this. Like that that can change the game. Like no, kickoff with no three one seconds expects, left. No one expects a Hail Mary on like first and ten from your own twenty five yard line. Also, that's not on a three step drop though. Like that's probably running ten yards and yeah, throwing so it. Yeah. Get the ball in the shotgun. Run or, to or your like own long end snap. Zone. Bring your long snapper out there. Yeah. Or no, run to your own end zone. Avoid all the defense. Get your thousand crow hops you need. And just by the time you've done that, your receivers have gotten into the end zone and then just chuck it deep. And worst case scenario, if, if you throw it that far, it's intercepted. That's like a 90 yard punt. Good. Good thinking. Yeah. Let him let him sling it. Industrial Revolution is going to be brought to you by Factor. Um, actually, Billy, before I talk about Factor, I do need your help because a lot of people around here are going on diets. That's like a thing, getting ready for football season, get those kickoff abs going. Um, I've decided it's bulking season. I've decided I'm going to just get jacked up. I want to be like 200, 210 pounds. I want to be strong. I want to get back mm -hmm. to like – being in real, real strong shape, which I never really was in. I don't know why I said back, but I want to get there. I'm going to need you to put me on a supplement diet, Billy. Mm -hmm. Can you do that? Can you get yes. me a regimen? I already have your meal plan. It's factor. It's factor. And I'm going to be using factor with a busy fall season just around the corner. You might be looking for wholesome, convenient meals for jam packed days. Factor is America's number one ready to eat meal kit. They can help you fuel up fast. They have chef prepared, dietitian approved, ready to eat meals. Dietitian and Billy Football approved, ready to eat meals. They get delivered straight to your door. What does that mean? Well, you're going to save time. You're going to eat well. You're going to stay on track with your healthy lifestyle. Refresh your healthy habits without missing a beat. Choose from 34 plus weekly flavor packed, dietitian approved meals, ready to eat in two minutes. Level up with the Gourmet Plus options that are prepared to perfection by chefs. Ready to eat in record time? Treat yourself. They got upscale meals. They've got premium ingredients like broccolini, leeks, truffle butter, asparagus. With Factor, you can rest assured that you're making a sustainable choice. They offset 100% of their delivery emissions. They source 100% renewable electricity for their production sites and offices, and they feature sustainably sourced seafood in their meals. This August, get Factor and enjoy eating well without the hassle. Simply choose your meals and enjoy fresh, flavor-packed meals delivered to your door. Head to factormeals.com slash dosing50. Use code dosing50, get 50% off. That's code dosing50 at factormeals.com slash dosing50 and get 50% off. Factor is going to send us some meals as well. Isn't that right, Mad Dog? Yeah. Arian, they're going to send you some meals. Beautiful. It's going to be fantastic, and I'm going to get swole. I'm going to be so jacked up. You guys will never even know it. Never even know it. Um, so, industrial revolution. Let's talk about real it. Real quick, before yep. we start that. Real, real quick, real quick, real quick. Big T, I'm going to need your help. Not right now, but I'm just giving you a pre-warning. I have a fantasy football league that I've been doing since, I don't know, 2016, 17. A bunch of retired dudes that played in the league. I looked at the list of like top 10 people on each. I don't know anybody's name. I don't know how good anybody is. So I'm going, I'm just letting you know, I'm going to hit you for like target this dude, target it. Cause I'm literally, I'm going to have a bunch of old dudes who probably ain't even going to be on rosters on my, on my team. I need, I need help. When's I am your draft? right now. Our draft is September 5th at 8 30 PM. Oh, you're really pushing it. I like that though. I That's like, like the, late the day drafts. before. I love that because you don't you don't have to worry about injuries happening preseason. That's true. I don't know. And 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 recently we just upped it, so it's like I don't know, it's like three hundred dollars get in, and so that's upped. And so we like up it every year, and then we're uh, we're getting this like football with like nameplates on it from everybody who's won, and so like you get it shipped to you after you won one. I've only won once, so. Who's who's Coming. the you best wanna... in your league? Everybody's won. Nobody's nobody's won twice. I believe. Yeah. You should come to Chicago, me, you, and PFT, and we'll do it live and stream it. Ooh. Well, actually, we're 
the dudes that are in Houston, because there's like six of us that are in Houston or five of us, we're all meeting at a dinner place. Okay. Maybe just like FaceTime us for each pick. <laughs> I like that. Or okay. Big, what, like what if Big T joined? I don't I hate fantasy football. I don't want to join. No, I'm saying like what if you went to Houston? You hate fantasy football? Yeah, I can't do it anymore. Why? It it became too like well, first of all, I don't love the NFL, so it's very like I, I don't care that much. Mm. But it's also just like so tedious, and I just I can't do it anymore. I love also it once you've gambled on football, fantasy football does nothing. That's true. Makes sense. That's true because there's so much you get the immediacy when you gamble on football, right? And it's like you're paying attention to the whole game instead of, Oh, there's a seven yard rush by Jameer Gibbs or whoever. Yeah. Like I would like to see you. who's in this league. Did you know, um, damn, I don't, I don't think there's any like super, super prominent cats. This cats that I play with, like, um, uh, uh, he's kind of saying you don't know ball. Yeah. It's just, yeah. That's kind of fucked up. No, no, well, they no, were Texans. So okay, man, really like two, two of my guards: Antoine Caldwell, Wade Smith. Oh, you might know Kevin Walter. He was a receiver with us. Yep. You know Kevin what? Walter. I I forgot that Andre Johnson played his last season with the Colts. That yeah, I that's good to know. Did he play <laughs> here for the Titans too? I'm not sure. Why is that good to know, Billy? Because yeah, I've been playing that new uh, NFL grid. He did play for the Titans. Yeah, and. I, I have a couple like Ryan Fitzpatrick, yeah, uh, Josh McCown, Josh Johnson, Josh Johnson. Like I got some, but that I think I had a Houston Colts one, which I probably should have gotten easier because there's a linebacker that is escaping me right now. That uh, he, yeah, so Johnson played his last season on the Titans. The season before that, he was on the Colts. I completely forgot oh. about those two seasons. Nine catches uh, for the Titans. There we go. For 85 yards. There we go. Uh, Adrian Peterson is another good back to remember for that game, Billy. Mm. I'm I'm obsessed with the grid. Frank put, Gore. Frank you, Gore. Yep. You put anything on a grid, and I will play it. That's – we. there should be a one one with movies. I'm going to hit up Jeff D. Lowe about that. Just have actors and actresses, and then you have to say the movie that they were in together. Billion-dollar idea, Jeff D. Lowe. Don't say I never do anything for you. The Departed. One movie. That's a movie. The Expendables. Just a that good movie to name. Arian would get fucked up by seeing Mark Wahlberg and Matt Damon on the same screen. Just be like, wait, that's the same person. They're in the same movie? Yeah. With oh, Leonardo shit. DiCaprio. That's, they're pushing it now. Yep. All right. Industrial Revolution. Let's talk about it. Billy, I know that you did a lot of research on this one. I did. You want to get did. it started? So... Uh, the Industrial Revolution is kind of the culmination of it t a bunch of advances in agriculture that sort of led to this new society where you didn't need as many people working in the fields, but then you had this congregation of labor that sort of got edged out by machinery. I might have totally butchered that, but. No, it started. It, it was the original steampunks. Yeah. They figured out that steam could turn a turbine. And when it was yeah. under pressure, then you could have these massive, massive boilers that would turn giant turbines that would then make shit move around. Uh, the Industrial Revolution began in England in the 18th century, and it quickly spread around the world. Uh, three reasons that led to the Industrial Revolution was the emergence of capitalism, European imperialism, and the agricultural revolution. So what happened? Some, what was going on before the Industrial Revolution? What was life like? Uh, it was kind of just like a lot of farmers, a uh, feudalism, if you will, just people working the land, bringing their wares, anything that they could make, whatever surplus they had from their homestead to a market where they exchanged their goods. And that was pretty much like the labor system. It was like a, a just sort of mercantilism in a way but it wasn't like large production of different types of wares it was sort of dinky but that was how it was for about like thousands of years like there wasn't that much difference 
between a farmer's lifestyle in 1200 and 1700. Hmm. Um, yeah, some of the it, it was like a hand me down clothes, hand me down wares. You had to take care yeah. of your shit before the Industrial Revolution. It wasn't yeah. so easy. You couldn't just go to a store and buy everything. You had tons of different skills to create different things, but the separation of labor hadn't taken hold yet. Uh, Adam Smith, Keynes, we'll talk about that later, really came into play when people realized we could be a lot more productive and make a lot more money if we had laborers doing specific things for a long amount of times so do you guys know how boats used to get around before the steam engine i mean Very obviously cool. obviously paddling you know people had oars that goes back a long way but before the steam engine and before the the steamboat uh kind of took over the way that you would move horses around like river or excuse me boats around rivers would be with horses so you would have horses that were on your boat and there would be a treadmill set up on the boat and then horses would walk on that, which would give the ferry power. So it would move the boat using literal horsepower. Oh, shit. Well, hmm. Fun so fact. Is that, and that's where horsepower from our engines come from? I'm going to say yes. Um, I, I think that's true. I think it is true. Had, it sounds they true. They had a cart. But then they have like carts and wagons like way before boats. I could be wrong about that. Yeah, but this is like actually taking the power from a horse. Some of the biggest inventions during the Industrial Revolution to cause uh, such change were the New Commons steam engine. The steam engine was invented by Thomas Newcomen in England in 1712. This steam engine pumped water using a vacuum created by condensed steam. Uh, the engine was an important invention because it trained out water from deep mines, thus making it vital to the mining industry today so they could get guys down there without having them drown. Uh, the flying shuttle was another big one invented by James K. It was a simple weaving machine uh, that he invented in France. Uh, before the invention of the shuttle, fabric was woven by two weavers passing a shuttle back and forth between them. So this exact shuttle basically halved the ability of the labor force because it just made the two people needed to weave only into one who probably just had to watch the machine. It was really like a domino thing where um, it started out. Um, Thomas Savory invented the first commercially used steam powered device, which was a steam pump that used steam pressure operating directly on the water. And um, the first engine was Newcomen, and he developed it in 1712 to transmit power. And then James Watt came and then improved on that. And then all these different yeah. various steam powered devices just got combined. They were just like, well, what if we use the steam power of this, combine it with the steam power of that, and then boom, we've got like an entire contraption. And then fast forward 300 years and you've got um, guys wearing goggles going out to bars and pretending that they live in the 1800s. Yeah. Steampunkin. Steampunkin. Like the power of steam must have been pretty. Now that I think about it, it's just like, I bet there, you know what? Rule 34. Steam powered sex toy. It doesn't I mean, look exist. it up. I'm on Let's it. Let's check it out. Look up 1800s. So there was a steam powered vibrator. What? There was a steam powered vibrator and it debuted in 1734, which sounds insanely dangerous. Um, excuse me, the vibrator debuted in 1734 and it used a crank, which you would like just turn with your hand like an egg beater. That feels like far more work than manual stimulation. Probably, probably. It, or like a, a fishing rod, like a reel that you would reel in. Uh, but in 1869, they made the steam-powered manipulator. Nice, nice date for and, it. And, yeah, good point, Billy. The machine had its engine in another room with the apparatus sticking through the wall. So like a glory hole for a steampunk vibrator. That is... That sounds very hot. It's not it's not like something you can hide in your bedside table. <laughs> it's just you have to have a room. <laughs> this is my vibrator Sweet. room, and this is the glory hole. Why did you buy? Why did you put that new addition on the side of your house? Oh, no reason. I just we wanted more space, just a uh, second bedroom in case the in laws came to visit. Oh, can I check it out? No. Yeah. So there was there was definitely a steam powered vibrator. I just that sounds like a high probability of. 
of a burn in a place you don't want to get a burn. We've mm. come a long way since then. No pun intended. Um, all right, yeah. So back to some more of the vo- more of the inventions, Billy. The spinning Jenny. Uh, this machine was able to spin at eighty and a hundred in twenty spindles. So that's also just taking more and more jobs. Watt steam engine we talked about seventeen sixty nine. This was probably probably the the first steam engine that started getting applied to lots of mass transportation. Uh, the water frame uh, was a model that could produce cotton threads the machine was able spinning 96 strands of yards at once uh the spinning mule which would spin multiple spools of yarns and thread it's a lot of loot it's a lot of uh textile stuff and we'll see uh in our interview that uh textile uh, makers was the big employer at this time uh and probably the most impactful uh uh machine in the role of it in of America, the cotton gin, uh, Eli Whitney in Savannah, Georgia, the cotton gin, uh, made it easier to, uh, separate cotton fibers from their seeds mm-hmm. than doing it manually. It revolutionized the cotton industry, but it also greatly increased the demand for cotton workers in the South, which led to more slavery. So the industrial revolution had a lot of consequences. Some would say, um, the ice box, we can all agree probably wasn't that problematic. Well, so I, right? I'm glad that you brought that up, Billy, because I've always wondered how people were able to freeze stuff, how ice boxes and ice. Could you get a cold drink back in the 1800s? No, no ice. So what's the, I think you could, I think they had ice. They shipped it though. And it was like weird. Like they just like cut off huge pieces of ice from like cold places and just bring it down. And then they put it in the basement, like, Big chunks of ice. Yeah, ice was probably like, super valuable back then. Yeah, I, like ice makers probably put the ice shipping business out. Like so, like another reason, so many jobs lost. The dudes that used to haul. So ice. you said that the steam there was a steam powered ice box. How how do you use steam to make ice? Uh, well, it was this simple wooden box lined with insulating material such as tin or zinc, with a large block of ice in a compartment near the top of the box. The outside of the box was lined with rabbit fur, other insulating fabrics. Uh, the ice box allowed for perishable foods to be kept longer than before. So it wasn't exactly like they were making ice. It was literally just an ice box. It was a box that you put ice in. Okay, got it. Uh, there's a puffing devil, which uh, Richard Trevithick patented. It was a steam-powered locomotive uh, from England. The contrapture was the first steam-powered train. And then the steam steam engine locomotive uh, george stevenson's patented in 1841 so that started hauling a ton of more coal out of the mines of killingworth england once more allowing more fuel from the industrial revolution the mechanical reaper uh basically took the grim reaper out of a job you know the grim reaper that scythe he holds well there was a bunch of dudes that used those scythes for work and the mechanical reaper totally took all their jobs uh the telegraph took a whole messenger company's jobs. Like everybody who used to just travel uh, messages across the country, like Pony Express took their job. The steel plow, uh, this guy also took a lot of jobs. Uh, and it's someone you know, John Deere invented the steel plow in Illinois in 1837. It was revolutionary because farmers were using cast iron plows at the time, which the soil would stick to, forcing the farmers to frequently clean off the plow. The steel plow could be polished so that soil would slide right off. The steel plow was a huge commercial success. And uh, John Deere's probably more of the popular industrial revolution. Do you uh, think that inventors? John Deere would have been as popular of a product if he didn't have the name John Deere? John Deere is a great name for a tractor. Yeah. Runs like a, runs deer. Like a deer. Nothing runs like a deer. Do you have a John Deere and Big T mowers? Uh, no, I need to get back to I haven't mowed in a long time. Yeah, we need that stream. I love those streams. There was also a steam gun. I'm actually surprised that it took as long as it did for them to figure out a way to weaponize this. I feel like mm. in, in modern society, if you have any new invention... The very first thing that happens is let's figure out a way to put it in a gun. Um, but it took a while. There was a gun that they used in the Civil War in the uh, 19th century that could fire, uh, I think it was like a, a 100 rounds per minute, 
which that's mm -hmm. a, that's a ton of rounds considering what they were working with beforehand. That's crazy, actually. The mm -hmm. Winnen steam gun. It was patented in 1858. 200 projectiles in one minute. So they used it. That's in the, crazy. That that's a lot. Yeah. I imagine that that probably won more than one or two battles. Keep going, Billy. The Bessemer the Bessemer process uh, allowed for the mass production of inexpensive steel and involved removing impurities from iron. So this is just you know the telephone, the phonograph, uh, big Edison inventions. Thomas Graham Bell, incandescent light bulb, electric motor, roller coaster, and airplane. They say that the airplane uh, was sort of the end of the Industrial Revolution. Um, and the Model T uh, is probably one of the last inventions. But those are the sorts of things that sort of really revolutionized the world. It's like you think about all those inventions from the micro to macro level, like a car, uh, airplane, really changed the world in a closer in that a hundred years of 1810 to 1910, then any change occurred uh, the, for the previous 2000. What do you guys think the best discovery of all time was? I'm going to go electricity discovery, not invention, not invention discovery. Yeah. Fire fire fires. One a fire. Yeah, you're right. Fire probably gets that beats electricity. Splitting electricity the atom. Pretty sick though. Electricity is great. I, I shudder to think what I would be doing for a living if it weren't for electricity. I would, I would die within a week if you put me back in like pre-electric times. That's why if you want a, uh, the EMP, fuck the nuke, drop yeah. an EMP. Yeah, how come we haven't had an EMP attack? Yeah, because we don't want that. Because we have men and women across this country working hard to prevent an EMP terrorist attack. Thank you, Billy. Yeah, I appreciate you standing up for them. But yeah. how come you're a big FBI guy? Yeah. Okay, so um, it's just interesting that you'd be pro-FBI. Anyways, I'm shocked that it hasn't happened, though, right? Like, we've, it feels like it would be easier to detonate an EMP, or there would be more people. I mean, it would be an act of war. Yes, oh, for sure. Well, an e but an EMP doesn't, there's, I don't think we have a device powerful enough to let off an EMP that, would cause more than a couple blocks radius of electrical. Oh, we for sure do. Sh no, but causing, but causing a, a, a power outage, I think would be much more effective and, you know, be easier to deny. Like some say that some people think that like Russia is going after electrical infrastructure in the United States right now, just to, there's actually, no, there, there was a Russian, Russian terrorists uh, held ransom um certain electrical grids that i think i'm pretty sure i'm correct i think that. that was live free or die hard it's a plot oh. to a die hard movie yeah i'm just surprised that it hasn't happened yet you would think that in all the conflicts that maybe it has happened maybe we've deployed one overseas we just don't know about it have you used an one uh, Turkey thinks that the U.S. and NATO caused an earthquake. Okay. Yeah. Oh, the first human-caused EMP occurred in 1962 when a 1 1.4 megaton Starfish Prime thermonuclear weapon detonated 400 kilometers above the Pacific Ocean. Jesus Christ. And you think we can't do a real EMP 50 years later? Yeah, but... 60? Yeah, but that's... Uh, but like a, that's a nuke causing an EMP. Mm -hmm. But I've seen Ocean's Eleven. You can have the nuke without the explosion, and it's just the EMP. I bet we've got all sorts of weapons out there that you could just like, they're more targeted probably. Well, Hiroshima and Nagasaki were were EMPs. They it, it was not considered a design part of the weapons, but they both sent out an EMP when they detonated. All right. So, like, we don't really have something that can only cause an EMP. I bet we do. I bet we do. You just gotta, you gotta think harder, Billy. The EMP is a side effect of a nuclear explosion. Yeah, yeah, exactly what I said. A non-nuclear EMP is being worked on, but the range and power would be low. Of course, then it could be targeted. 
Yeah, so it, the EMP then becomes a target for the nuke. Got it. All right, um, we've got a great interview. If you want to actually listen to more about the Industrial Revolution and the Luddites, which I think I'm Team Luddite, you'll have to listen to the interview. They get a bad rap. They do. They do. When you think Luddite, you think somebody that just like is dumb, too dumb to use technology. Not the case. Not the case at all. The Luddites kind of rocked, and we're probably about to see another Luddite movement. All right, um, so we're going to get into our interview with Brian Merchant. Here he is. All right, we welcome on a very special guest to Macrodosing. It's Brian Merchant. He wrote what looks to be an awesome book. I can't wait to read it. It's called Blood in the Machine. It comes out on September 26th. It's about uh, the Luddites and the Industrial Revolution. And I am I'm pumped to, to read about this because there's a blind spot in history that I've got. I don't know that much about it, but it seems awesome. It seems like it's also relevant to uh, to the times that we live in right now. So, Brian, thank you for joining the show. Yeah, thanks for having me. So um, where do we want to start with this? Do you want to maybe share a little bit about your background, how you got into writing about this sort of thing? Yeah, sure. Uh, so I, I've been a tech journalist for 15 years now, ages. Uh, and when I started out, it was pretty, you know, pretty run of the mill. Tech companies put out their products and you write about them and, you know, they're getting bigger and bigger and apples you know beginning its quest for world domination amazon the same and google uh so we weren't really all that critical or as critical as we could be in the mainstream tech press so i was working for vice at the time so we got to be a little uh we got to be a little snappier but for a long time these tech giants they got to do pretty much whatever they wanted you know they were beloved by the public the, everybody uses their products um, and it's not until there's a, a few red flags that start going up that we start to go, well, well wait a minute, what, what's going on here? Um, we, we, especially when we start to get into automation and artificial intelligence and it starts hitting people closer to home, um, it starts transforming the way that people work, right? Like Uber and, and Lyft seemed really cool at first and then fast forward 10 years down the line and People are barely making a living wage, even though they're driving for 60 hours a week. And now we got open AI coming along and they're trying to sell all these products that say, hey, you know, if you hire illustrators right now, we've got something that can automatically generate uh, uh, images for you. You don't need those illustrators anymore. You might not need copy editors. You might not need uh, administrators. You might not need all these different uh, these, these workers. So all of a sudden it, we're feeling a lot more sort of stress, a lot more anxiety over the changes that these big tech companies have been making over the last 10 years. And I started looking into the Luddites before this most recent wave of AI, but really when sort of gig work was uh, was on the scene and was starting to make some people pretty miserable. It was doing some good things, doing a lot of bad things. So I've stumbled upon this story of the Luddites, which we all myself included, completely misunderstood, right? We just, if you think of Luddite, you think of someone who's an idiot, somebody who hates technology, somebody who's got a knee-jerk reaction, somebody who doesn't know how to use an iPhone or just hates progress in general. But it turns out that that's all wrong. And we can talk about, you know, why that is and who the Luddites really were and what they really stood for during the Industrial Revolution that you mentioned. All right, cool. So in... In my understanding of the Industrial Revolution, it, it began when people figured out that you could use steam to power machines and mass produce things. And everything beforehand was done like in-house. People would make their own clothes, make their own housewares. There would be, you know, blacksmith things that, you know, you would you would go around town and get from various people who had various uh, trades and crafts that they practiced. And then once mass production started to hit, it's like all these people started to lose a lot of their income and more and more people were just being taught how to run the machines as opposed to actually make the things that that everybody was purchasing and that consolidation of wealth and consolidation of i guess skills um, among the uh, the working class translated into a group of people called the luddites that just stood up and said hey no moss like we don't this is not good we see where this is going and it's kind of it's ironic because we do think of them as being uh you know luddites it's they're you're a step behind progress right like you, you're willfully pushing against progress in any, any way shape or form but in reality they were like five steps ahead where they could see where this is all going 
and they said, this is going to be bad for everybody. I know it's nice to be able to buy clothes and, you know, get a lot of things that maybe weren't available on a uh, mass produced level earlier, but ultimately this is going to lead to some bad stuff down the line. So who was, who were the first Luddites and how did they consolidate together? Yeah. Yeah, that's pretty much right. So the Luddites were, before they became the Luddites, they were cloth workers. And, you know, you you can kind of sort of compare the Luddites to sort of maybe creative workers, uh, people who are doing gig workers uh, today or before they were doing gig work, if they were driving a cab, if they had a better job, or if they're, you know, doing that kind of illustration, they were never sort of, they were never super rich or super prosperous, but they were kind of the middle class, sometimes even even sort of more comfortable. They were doing all kinds of, of cloth work. And this is the biggest sort of job se- sort of segment in the Industrial Revolution. Well, before the Industrial Revolution kicks up pace, it's already the biggest sort of industry in England is cloth making, working with wool, working with cotton, working with lace and silk and that kind of thing. So Britain really was like, that's why it happened in Britain is because they were primed to have this huge sort of industrial base term be mechanized. Uh, and that's and when that started happening, um, those cloth workers were so numerous that they could really make some noise. Um, there was a lot of laws on the books. You couldn't organize. You couldn't you couldn't form a union. That was against the law. You couldn't you couldn't even sort of just sort of gather together and say, hey, this sucks. This is uh, we don't want to be forced into this factory. We don't want you to use this machine. We don't want you to cut our wages. So you re- they really had very few options. So we're talking about 1800 or so when we really start to see these machines begin to be used in a certain way. And I think it's important, the Luddites and the cloth workers, they were actually really good at technology. They had the tech in their house, though. They had it in their cottages. You know, you might have heard the term cottage industry. It comes from these cloth workers who had like the loom or the or, or the stocking frame, and they had it either in a small shop or like at home. They were working from home with their families, and they had a pretty nice situation. Um, it's what they, what they protested was less the actual use of machinery. But when a handful of rich guys said, okay, what we're going to do is we're going to put all those machines in a giant building. We're going to call it a factory. We're going to make it six stories high. There's going to be no windows. And you're going to do what I say when you're working for me. And I'm going to pay you a wage. Not You're not going to pay, like you were saying, you're not going to pay the merchant who's going to do the cloth. You're not going to have any autonomy. So that's as much what the Luddites were fighting against um, as anything, more than the march of technology. They were fighting the march of this factory system, which they really saw as like a system of domination. Like they were going to be put under the thumb. Um, and they, like you said, they were five steps ahead. They were absolutely right. Once the factory owners started doing this, it's all downhill from the reason that so many of us work in offices, which is based after the, uh, off of the factory or um, in actual factories is because those industrials m- won that battle. But I guess we're getting ahead a little bit. I'm going to push back on you real quick. So yeah. uh, the industrial revolution, they start building factories. It gave yeah. a lot of kids great jobs. And taught them great skills, <laughs> right? Taught right, them yeah. taught them how to be grown ups. Right. It taught the it taught the eight year olds how to like reach their hands into a spinning gear fast enough that they didn't get it chopped off because if they didn't, it would be. Uh, yeah. No, that's absolutely right. They the jobs were being we, we call economists call this de skilling when you have like a skilled job somebody does a good job has done for a long time and then you can use a machine to kind of do a worse job probably but for cheaper and then you hire yeah a child or an unskilled worker or uh or or a migrant or at that time a woman um who to to work to work the machine and yeah it's it's super deadly if you 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 know kids are getting torn up by these machines um quite literally you know killed by by the, the by the conditions in these in these factories and the luddites saw that too and they thought that they should fight against that so the luddites really finally come together when they have tried for like a, a decade from 18 uh, from the year 1800 or 1801 or so until 1811 they're lobbying government they are staging peaceful protests they're doing everything they can think of to try to get uh some wage protections they want minimum wages they want some 
uh, at least some sort of protections against the machines. They come up with all these ideas that are more what we would think of coming from someone like Andrew Yang uh, today, which is like, hey, why don't you tax the machine a little bit, give us a little bit of money to retrain ourselves. They put that stuff forward 200 years ago, and they were just completely ignored, of course. Uh, and they really just finally had their backs up against the wall. And then there's this perfect storm. They got a war with uh, Napoleon going on. Taxes are high. There's a bad harvest. And then finally, sort of the entrepreneurs make this push and say, OK, we're really going to start automating everything. And then the Luddites say, you know what? No. Uh, and they really uh, sort of stand up and they it gets violent in about 1811. Billy, what were you going to say? I was just going to ask uh so you're talking about how the Luddite movement was more kind of anti-oligarchy in a way and not exactly machine oriented. How would that reflect today? We're seeing this, you know, we're going to get to it in a little, but we're seeing AI. Everyone's scared of how it's going to be the next industrial revolution. We're going to be moving in progress so much faster, just like the industrial revolution. You know, the difference between 1810 and 1910 is a like 10 times more than uh, 1710 to 1810. We're in 2023. I mean, the jump to 2123 is going to be faster than anything we've seen. How do you think we're going to be able to, you know, prevent it from what would be your solution to the change we're about to see in the next, you know, 100 years? Yeah. I mean, so the, th mm -hmm. I, the the same thing is pr the same principle is pretty much true today. You're absolutely right. That's a good way to frame it. They were not anti machine. They were anti oligarchy or anti sort of the one percent getting all the gains from the machines. And they still have to do this work. That's the thing. If they want to eat, then they're not. They might not be able to work at home anymore. They're just going to have to go in the factory, or their kids are going to have to go in the factory. So they're still going to have to do this stuff. They're still going to have to work. It's just the work is a lot less dignified. The work is a lot more brutal. Uh, so today, I think a good thing to look at is what the writers and actors and sort of illustrators are are fighting against right now, which is if you look at it, the writers aren't saying we don't want. No, we don't want AI to exist. We don't want AI to come. Uh, we don't. We don't want. We don't want to ignore it. But we don't want the studio bosses to be the ones to say how, how it's going to be used. And they both think that if studio bosses get carte blanche to do whatever they want, then a they're going to make a bunch of really shitty movies. They're just going to press the button and churn out crap. And b they're going to be able to hit that button and then. They're still going to call in the writers and say, look, this thing sucks. ChatGPT can't write a good movie yet. but So we need somebody to come in and fix it and maybe even rewrite the whole thing. But look, we just don't want to pay you uh, to do that the same way that we were paying you before. So if you look at what's going on, it's a way that they can break down pay structure. It's a way for power to sort of use this new technology that they maybe don't even care about that much. It's an opportunity for them to justify paying people less. So the big question isn't, you know, do we just say no to this technology, um, which I think is not the answer, but it's saying like, what do we do now to sort of make sure that we can distribute power better or distribute the gains better or give more people say over how it's going to be used in their lives. So that's kind of an open question. I mean, union power is one way to do it. But, you know, right now it's, you know, the writers and the actors can do this because they have strong unions. You know, an, a freelance illustrator can't really do the same thing if they're worried that their clients are going to start using AI. Uh, so they have to do other things. So we really have to start thinking about different ways of approaching the technology, making, I think the first step is saying, hey, this the problem isn't the technology, it's who gets to use it and who gets to tell everybody else this is the way it's going to be. And I don't think we want a society where a handful of people can just say, all right, this is how AI is going to be used. You're going to lose your job. Your job is going to be degraded. Uh, you're not you're going to have to move over there and do something else. We all want to say in how and how that gets negotiated. Interesting. I was, I was going to say an interesting um, uh, vantage point that I had never uh thought about until one of my friends who is a huge painter she paints for like a bunch of like you know big name people and she's like really good at what she does um one of the one of the points that she brought up was that it's it's kind of like intellectual property theft because ai has no reference point other than 
its barrage of images on the internet, which are other artists doing work, right? Um, and that in itself is is an issue. And so I want to get your vantage point on on that as well as the uh, the I guess the the side of of actually litigating this kind of stuff because I mean just now I mean the 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 vessel that we're using to talk via Zoom they just updated their preferences um, and their terms and terms and agreements I mean and one of the one of the tenets I read some of it one of one of it is that they're allowed to use any of this anything that we say in all of our images right and they're allowed to use that and incorporate that and give it to AI. And so to me, again, that's that's intellectual property theft. Like we're agreeing to these terms and agreements, but it's very new. And so like that side of things needs to be attacked vehemently. But you got Congress people, you know, uh, in the hospital because they fell. So it's it's hard. To, <laughs> it's hard. To, <laughs> it's, hard it's, it's hard to attack that. But I want to get your vantage point on that. Yeah, no, your uh, your artist friend is is, is absolutely right. Um, and uh, this it became clear because. We, what they've been doing this for a long time and we didn't really notice because we you know they primed the pump basically by giving us access to social media all these things for so long and that that stuff is that stuff is public so artists get used to just kind of sharing their stuff on social media sharing links to websites that are built by the big tech companies uh writers creators everybody everybody does that um and so They've been training these models for years and years. They didn't really tell, especially the artists or or, or or the creators, what they were doing until until now. And they train their models so you know so fully and directly on those artists' work that it, it was to the point, at least in the beginning, where you could just type in to you know Dolly, which is OpenAI's image service or Midjourney, and say, "I want art that's like." uh you know that's like picasso or some or somebody who's still alive like you know a big one was molly crabapple who does a bunch of uh illustrations and has shared her stuff online a bunch and it would just you know it would just spit out an image that was just basically crib from their style completely and it was obviously that it, that it had just plagiarized that so mm -hmm. you have this situation where all of a sudden if you're just buying a mid-journey subscription and you're a big company you can just go like i want art like this and the artist gets completely boxed out of the situation um and the artists are firing back by filing class action lawsuits saying hey we never consented we never said it was okay for the for you guys to use this these images um and now you can just rip us off uh without us getting any we don't even get you know pennies on the dollar when you whenever you do that so it's it, it it's absolutely a lot of people call it like a plagiarism machine because yeah. that's what it's doing it's really people it looks cool right when you use it it's got like that flashing cursor or you put it in you can get some kind of cool looking stuff and it types out a text for you to do this in the style of whatever but that's all it's doing. It's reorganizing information that's been on the internet, that's been in books, that's been, uh, you know, in paintings and pictures and all that. And it's just spitting them back out. It does it in a smart way, in a way that makes us look, that look at it with sort of, uh, you know, new new eyes. But it's really just that. It is a plagiarism machine. I sympathize completely with all those artists who who are who are fighting back. So how we fight back is like a big question. How those artists. Uh, get a foothold because yeah, it's it's going to be a tough battle because you basically have to to argue that just by teaching the machine uh, with these pictures, you know, that you are that you're doing plagiarism or that you're infringing on someone's intellectual property. And there may be a case there, but it really depends on 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 sort of the courts that it goes through because you could you know, right now, the precedent is like you said, it's old. It's like, oh, if you're if you read a book and then write something in that style on your blog, that's not illegal. But we're not machines and the machines have so much more sophistication and capacity to rip stuff off. So, yeah, I mean, I I wish I had more faith in Congress to sort of step up and do something that would actually protect uh, artists and creators. But it's going to be a long road and it's going to be uh, uh, it's going to take a lot of noise making if anything like that's going to happen. I want to get back to the Luddites in a second, back to the yeah. uh, the Industrial Revolution. But I, I have to ask, like, as a tech journalist, do you actually do you read every terms of service that you come across? Like when you sign up for a new app, are you like, well, got to dig into this because who knows what's in here? 
Absolutely not. That would, would <laughs> all day, man. Like that would be your day. If you, yeah. if every time Zoom pushes out a new uh, user agreement, every time Google does it, if yeah. we, you know, a lot of, there's actually been really interesting legal argumentation that says, you know, a lot of terms of service aren't even valid because you they're can't... not enforceable, right? Like right. a reasonable person doesn't have the time to sit down and read every paragraph when they're signing up for an app because they're trying to pay uh, for a parking spot outside on a city road, you know? Right, exactly. You, it's uh, it's completely unreasonable. And they and I, you can get a lot of that stuff kind of thrown out. The tech companies are very good at sort of making reams of it. So you just kind of go, yeah, whatever. So they at least have a case. But even they know that it that it's somewhat negotiable and the zoom and it is also liable to change after a backlash so the zoom thing uh after the zoom someone noticed the zooms update of, the, of their user agreements which was that's one of the worst that i've ever seen it's like we can do what right now we're talking on zoom and according to their their terms of service update they can do anything they want with this they could they could feed it into ai they could make a, a promo video they could promote it on zoom's website they could resell it they could turn it into a, a comedy sketch they could do whatever they want with this video uh and then so after but after that backlash they're like actually we we agree not to to train ai on this uh but we can still do everything else. So I think we should still be thinking about, you know, the AI is maybe the scariest thing because we, nobody wants a weird uh, pixelated replica of them on re released on the internet, you know, just trained on this video or whatever, but they can still do all that other stuff. All they had to do is step back and say, you know what, we're not gonna, uh, we're not gonna feed you into the AI machine, but everything else, we can take this video, cut it, chop it, sell it, license it, make money off of it. We can do all of that. We can store it indefinitely. An archive of this video is gonna sit on Zoom servers in forever, for as long as they want it to be. Uh, but they've said that they won't train AI on it anymore. Uh, so anymore. you know. What are where are these lines? Free, draw? You are the product, right? We're the product, right? Real, now. real quick question, man. So I don't know shit about uh technology. Like I'm fairly, you know, savvy. You know, I stream. I, you know, I play video games. I, you know, I got social media, so I'm fairly aware of what's going on. Yeah. But from my like, from my very, you know, novice position, I feel like there has to be some kind of, you know, as as a as a a tech journalist there has to be something that you've ran across to where like coders or you know people that make this shit have like a fail safe you know that says if it gets to this point like we got to do this you know like like there has to be like some kind of like you know you know re deconstructing of a, of a of a deep fake video or something that says if we run it through this it's easy to tell you know there has to be some kind of fail safe that somebody is working on if not we're just a whole bunch of frankensteins and that's just like it's a free for it just I, I just refuse to believe you know i'm a pessimist of all pessimists but i believe there's some people out there like that are aware of the problem but like no we got these fail safes dog and i i got you <laughs> yeah i mean i wish there there were better ones i mean people try to do it to uh to your point earlier on even the tech worker even the people who are coding this stuff you know 99 percent of them are are you know are are more like you and I, but they're not calling the shots. They're writing the code. They're doing the engineering. They're figuring things out. But that oligarchy still exists within the tech companies too. Right. So ultimately, it's Sam Altman and those guys who who are making who are making the calls and decide how this gets to be used. And they have like some tools. Like they have a they actually discontinued it. But for a while, they had a tool that said, well, this this can sort of uh, at least tell uh you if 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 some if a block of text was made by open ai you can run it back through its machine and then it'll say this was ai generated uh but they discontinued it because it wasn't accurate enough because again it's just washes of text that that, mm. that these machines are just spitting out sometimes there's no rhyme or reason to it um and one of the big things that people are fighting for are at sort of like the lowest level it's just like watermark this people want to say hey this was made by ai this image was made by ai this video was made by ai this song was made by ai that's got to be a rule right now it's not right now it's a free-for-all uh so there are really smart tech people who probably do have some good solutions about how to do stuff like that or how to how to sort of you know 
undeep fake deep fakes as you were saying uh who have the technological capacity but the problem is is that we get, we're living in a situation where you know open ai has a partnership with microsoft right google is the other one doing ai you know amazon owns most of the web infrastructure it's truly an oligarchy of tech companies you have like five big tech companies and they're calling all the shots so unless you can get to the executive level of those companies, that's, you got to change it. That's that's what, that's what I guess is my question. Who's the yeah. bad guy? Because the guy's writing it is like on some Nuremberg trial stuff where it's just like I'm just doing my job and they writing the codes for this shit that is catastrophic for our society. Yeah. Who are the bad guys? Who do we point out and say, you motherfucker, is you? I had to Google. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, it is. It's you got to You got to aim the fire at 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 the at the executives of these companies because they've got the power. They've got the decision making capacity. They're calling the shots. And it's it, yeah, it's it is, you know, it's it's not really much of a surprise. It's these guys. It's 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 Jeff Bezos. It's it's the C-suite at Google. It's, you know, Sam Altman is. He he talks a good game out there and says, oh, you know, we got to be careful with how we're doing this because we don't want, you know, want anybody to get. Hurt. And they're still doing it. They're still they're just pumping the gas with the other foot while they're doing that, while they're saying, yes, come come regulate us. You know, we <laughs> welcome uh, Congress to, to sort of look at what we're doing. And he's just got his foot on the pedal the whole time. Because well, he knows you... that Congress isn't going to be able to do anything like he knows that who is in Congress, like Arian alluded to, like. If yeah. you if you watch a congressional hearing with anybody from a tech company, it's questions that were prepared by a staffer who yeah. like at, probably crowdsourced their own questions to ask this person. And yeah. then they're fed to a congressperson who has no idea what they mean. And there's a complete inability to f do any follow up questions to whatever answers the tech companies give to them. And so that's if I was if I was ahead of a, a company that was heavily leveraged in AI right now, I, I would absolutely welcome congressional inquiries. It's like, yeah, what are you going to ask me? Like, uh, is this robot going to take my granddaughter's job? No, sir. No, absolutely not. That's not going to happen. <laughs> and then you just move on to the next question. Yeah, Billy. What do advocates say is going to be the you know solution to the frictional unemployment of AI? Because when they say new technology is coming, it's going to create new jobs elsewhere. I, I don't really see where. AI is going to create new jobs and hope you probably know both sides better. What are they saying is going to be the benefit of this? Yeah, I mean, it's the same kind of thing that is said over and over. I think the difference that we're seeing now is in the previous industrial revolutions, the advocates for, you know, for more automation, more mechanization, they could say like, well, look, you know, yes, this is causing a lot of pain to a lot of people, but now we can make clothing cheaper or, you know, 100 years later, it's now we can make cars cheaper or we can make machines cheaper. Now we get into interesting questions of, well, what's getting made cheaper here? Like art that people makes? Like, do we do we really have a really high demand to get more sort of like internet gifts, like automated uh, <laughs> by like pressing a button. Like, do we need? Oh like, yeah, memes. Yeah. More <laughs> memes. Yeah. Cheaper well, right memes. now, what you're suggesting is that we should artificially reduce the amount of epicness that happens online by <laughs> by saying that we shouldn't automate. I want my gifts faster. I want them uh, more. You just want a wave tailored. of them to wash over you. Jeez, yeah, the memes <laughs> of production. Yeah, <laughs> there, there you go, Aaron. So, but it's, and now when every time that happens, it's like, it is a question that we have to negotiate. Like, okay, now, like if we want that stuff cheaper and cheaper, then like, yeah, we risk losing out on having a whole section of the economy where creative people are making stuff. Like, mm -hmm. is it important to us that we can have even that stuff, even like our cultural products, even our movies and film and, and, and TV shows and, uh, you know, pop songs. Do we want all that stuff to be made by, by AI? I think that's a real question. And do we want it to be made by AI knowing that if we do, that the people who actually made all the stuff in the past are, are losing out. So I think it is like a bit more of a loaded question this time because, we, you know, we can we can try to make that decision and make that call and we can put up guardrails that like sort of 
protect people that that do this stuff. They can still use the technology, but we got to find ways to protect the people who, if we think that's important, if we think it's important that that there are people who are actually, you know, having opinions on podcasts and uh, having real conversations. And if it's not just a not bunch of automated voices sort of talking over each other. Yeah, I was fine with with AI taking everybody's job until you said podcasters. Now I'm <laughs> now I'm on on the side of the Luddites on this one. Can we jump back to the Luddites? Because I, I, I have a couple questions about them and their movement. So um, they start smashing factories, destroying machines, going after some of the uh, yeah. Some of the oligarchs, the people that are that are instituting these brand new factories, were they able to accomplish any of their goals? Were they did they make any incremental change or did they influence the Industrial Revolution in a way that benefited them? Or was it kind of all resistance is futile? No, they actually did a good they, the oh, irony sorry. of that is wild. <laughs> To use a Borg reference, <laughs> <laughs> they're completely automated species. Man. That's wild. <laughs> yeah, they they uh, they made some real gains for a while, especially. And the th the other thing that we need to talk about is that their uh, opposition was basically the British army. So the crown, the 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 prince at the time, Prince Regent, who was ruling England, um, and his administration they sent just tens of thousands of troops into the industrial districts to put down the uprising by force. Um, and I just a quick note about what the Luddites were actually doing is that they were being, they were being smart and they were playing a public relations game too. So what they did, Ned Ludd was this, was this mythical figure who either they made up or was kind of a legend at the time. It's hard to say, like this kid who was forced to work in a, in, in a factory for uh, for a boss and he didn't want to do it. So the boss had him whipped and he got mad and smashed the machine and fled into Sherwood Forest. This is happening in the same place where Robin the, the Robin Hood legend is. So there's like a real culture of resistance, of standing up uh, and sort of a, 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 of, of legend. Um, so, you know, you can even say Ned Ludd, Robin Hood, they sound a lot alike. So they're probably inspired from the same material. Um, so what they would do is they would organize these raiding parties, basically, and they'd send like a letter and they'd or they'd post it to the factory wall and say, we know you've got 100 automating machines in there. If you don't take them down, you're going to get a visit from Ned Ludd's army. And sometimes the factory owner would go like, oh, shit, and they'd take them down and they'd be OK. But if they didn't then they would either by night or at gunpoint, they would come in and they would just smash the machines that were doing the automating that basically the factory owners were using to replace uh, the workers or to degrade their jobs or having children run those those machines. And they'd smash them and they'd leave and they'd leave them with a note and, or, and they'd say, okay, if you, we've smashed, we've taken away these machines. If you put them back, you're we're going to return and this time there'll be no mercy we will burn the factory to the ground so they did that over and over and over all across uh, the industrial districts of england manchester nottingham york huddersfield so and it was a completely decentralized movement where we don't even know how much communication they actually had all you needed to have was this figurehead ned ludd or G general ludd or king ludd and you could basically threaten factory owners and for a while, they actually were really successful. So in, in Nottingham, they were like, the factory owners were like, no, we don't want anything to do with this. We'll restore wages. We'll give you all raises. Just promise not to smash any more machines. Uh, this, this will be good. The problem is, is that you can't, like factory owners, you know, aren't all like a uniform, un united bunch. So there's still going to be some saying, okay, well, if down the road, if he took down his machines. Now I've got a profit opportunity. So I'll just ramp it up. I'll hire, I'll, I'll hire some soldiers to come in and, and guard the place. But I, I, so then they go like, well, well, he's got his back up and then it just creeps back up over and over again. So without any actually like policy or laws or any understanding, it's hard to keep that at bay. But for about a year, you know, you really do see in some areas, uh, a lot of uh, a, a lot of uh, progress made on wages and things, 
And then you see a lot of people coming together who have never talked about this stuff before. And some of that transitions into sort of like reform movements where you're actually you're figuring out how to sort of use even if it's against the law, you figure out ways to sort of use your combined power. And it works in some cases. They they do win some gains. And in some areas, like in Manchester, which was the biggest and fastest industrializing area, uh, they actually got they actually kicked out the automating machines for like 30 years. So they did win some resounding victories, but then the state fights back, thousands of factory, I mean thousands of soldiers come occupy the factories. Uh, they round up the Luddites. There are some like really violent battles. Uh, you know, eventually they just, they they wear them down, right? Like these are cloth workers, they're heroes. People love the Luddites at the time, which is really interesting when you think about, if you know the word Luddite today, you know it as the idiot, as we said up top, but back in the time, people would cheer the Luddites. They'd like come out in their, uh, of their houses and, and root them on if they saw them smashing the machines. Like this was because they knew too, right? Yeah. They knew, they knew too. If you're a shoemaker, or if you're a steel worker, or a, or a, a coal worker, rather, they know that what's happening in terms of workers being forced into the factory, being forced that they had a phrase for it. They hated to stand at their command. They didn't want to stand at anybody's command. Who would? So they knew that the factory system was going to come for them all. So they got support from people from you know from apprentices from students from you know women who had lost their jobs to machines decades ago they they got all this support they were folk heroes uh for a while until the state just literally had to send in a domestic occupying force to crush them hmm. and so uh fast forwarding to to the modern era now jeff bezos has his like robot dogs that he can just sick on people that try to smash anything there that's always <laughs> concerning right when it's like hey here's a here's a giant tech company they're investing heavily in robot dogs yeah who Did who's asking the, for those the <laughs> ai robot dogs that they made yeah that, that's yeah. the worst boston dynamics plus ai that's like what yeah, yeah. um i want to kick it to big t i'm sure big t's got something hot for you yeah, so you just mentioned like they had, the Luddites had some victories and people really liked them, but I, I don't want to spoil the end of your book, events that happened 200 years ago, but they don't really win. Yeah. Um, so today we have a similar economic and technological impasse, I guess. Do you see even enough resistance just in society to detrimental things with AI or technology that could be going on to even, you know, have a chance of stopping some of it? Or do you, are most people just, you know, most regular people, they see this, they have other problems to worry about. They don't really, you know, it doesn't matter. And even if there was, do you think it's past the point of stopping it? I mean, I don't think we're going to, we're going to stop it to the point where, AI is going to disappear in this way, in the way that it's being used. Um, we're not going to put that genie back in the bottle, most likely. But AI is unique. And you see this every so often. It happened with automation. Again, it happened with the with the Luddites. But you, you see these polls coming back. People that usually don't really give a shit about technology or have kind of wishy-washy feelings about big tech. People react to AI and are worried about AI in a way that is somewhat unique and it's a galvanizing force. So you see people supporting the writers in the the actors, even though, you know, a lot as try as the studios might to sort of cast them as a uh, unrelatable lot, you know, they're making movies, they're big Hollywood or whatever. But no, people say I I don't want AI coming for my job either. So I support the writers, not the studios. You see a lot of a lot of sort of I don't know like sort of growing solidarity around this. Um, I'm in LA and there's there's strikes all over. It's not just SAG. It's not just it's not just the actors. It's not just the writers. People are going on strike. Uh, you know, uh, in the city, people are going on strike uh, at hotels. People are going on strike against against app work, and you know we've seen what's happened at Amazon. So, like, I would say that there is a, a potential right now, a specifically around AI. It's a galvanizing force, mm -hmm. and it can sort of 
it can sort of inspire people to sort of to sort of stand up. And the tech companies kind of recognize that. You look back at the at the last year, and it seems like all we've been hearing about AI and oh, AI can do this and AI can do that. Well, a lot of that's manufactured because they know that they've got to yell, they got to promote this stuff all out. And you notice when they do say we got to be worried about this, it's not about they they don't really talk about jobs much. They talk about like oh, it's the AI. We want to be we want to make sure we do this right so we don't cause the apocalypse. That's how powerful our technology is. It could cause like a nuclear holocaust. It could become Skynet. Well, that's like seven steps down the line, but they're focusing on that because that lets them get away with all the smaller stuff in the meanwhile. Mm -hmm. So they know that they have like a small window to try to sell as much of this stuff to companies as they can. Uh, they're trying to sell enterprise AI software. That's where the money is. They're trying to sell things to clients like Microsoft, to like factories, to smaller businesses, to, you know, consultancy firms, that kind of stuff. And once people sort of recognize what's at stake, I do think a lot of people are going to be angry and, and willing to sort of push back. I they're, like they're about to mess up by, by fucking with the wrong people, the truckers. The, tr yeah. the trucking industry is one of the first targets for AI, at least from what I've read, where, mm -hmm. okay, you're still going to need truckers to drive the last mile, the last two miles, whatever the case might be. Um, yeah. When it comes to driving in cities, smaller roads, things get a little bit more dicey that you can't just use software for as reliable as you know the open road. Yeah. But once they start fucking with the truckers, the truckers are always looking for a fight. <laughs> These guys, and, and God bless them, because they've been, they've been kicked around for the last 30, 40 years. They've exactly. been at the, at the whim of the big bosses. And so I feel like once AI comes for the truckers' jobs, they can just hit the brakes and just clog up the highway system, mess up the roads, and then now they've got the upper hand. Then they give kind of a blueprint. Obviously, not every industry can clog up highways. Yeah. But if they go for the truckers first, the truckers will be the ones that stop, that step up and push back against them. Then that gives a blueprint to every other industry being like, hey, you can do something about this. You can fight back against these people. Yeah. No. Uh, yeah. I'm glad you mentioned that. And you mentioned that like a lot of the a lot of these anger, uh, a lot of this anger and sort of the protest. Right. It's not just about AI, but it's after you've been kicked around for years and years that it sort of culminates in this. And then the companies say, like, well, actually, we want to you know do your job with AI. And then that's the last straw a lot yeah. of times. And mm -hmm. there's a reason that, I, you know, Andrew Yang, that's the example he uses with with truckers, um, because you have a, a, a in a lot of jobs in, in a lot of states rather that's the best paying or the largest job especially for people without a college degree so you have more truckers uh in some states than than any other job um and we've seen the same thing happen to them that have happened to a lot of other you know the writers and the actors they complain about uh the gigification you know of their jobs the truckers 100 percent, their jobs have been gigified and made let precarious and they, they they don't it's not the same sort of stable job that it was 20 years ago they have to they have to be more flexible they have to run more hours they have to work through contractors uh that rather than big companies and then yeah when that when the automation starts when the ai starts you have a a, a powerful you know industrial worker base right there like you're saying and they could absolutely stand up and they could absolutely uh, you know, just barricade a highway and say, you know what? No. And that's, and that's like the Luddite spirit is, is saying, is saying no, when you have moral and economic justification for doing so, and they could absolutely do it. You're right. One of my last questions, but what do you think the intent behind a guy like Elon Musk? He helped fund open AI so that people could see what this technology could do. He was called specious by I think Sam Altman, it was when he was like, what are we going to do about this? And that's sort of the new term, I think. That's going to be the new derogatory to someone who's anti-AI specious. Like what? Just because this being isn't like organic, that it's it doesn't have a right to work. But do you think he's really yes, in the right Yes, I would right say place? yes, I agree with that. <laughs> <laughs> that might be a hot take. That non-organic beings? Yeah, yeah, fuck them. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. This is gonna but, look uh, bad. I'm, this is gonna look very like my grandkids are gonna be watching this. Be like, 
Granddad was a fucking species. Oh, 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 man. Canceled. Canceled in the year 2180. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, no, but uh, do you think that he's one of these people who's just sounding the alarm and being like, oh, it's going to cause the apocalypse and the matrix and they're going to be just harvesting our body warmth for energy? Or do you think he, he's he's an actual Luddite in the true spirit where he believes and he wants humans to still have life and still have a use? I, you know, I think, I think, I think he, Elon Musk is, is legitimately concerned. Like, I think he is actually concerned about the apocalypse scenario. He's, he's traced some of the threads and he thinks that it's a possibility that down the line, you know, he's always, he's not always as concerned with sort of the conditions of people like right now. I think he's, that's why he's always thinking about Mars and he's thinking about, you know, uh, uh, years down. I think, but his, he's his, off the whole bunch of Twitter employees, didn't he? Yeah, he cut high, he fired half of them, maybe 75% at this point. Uh, yeah, so I don't, he's worried about, or I, I think he thinks that there's a real chance that AI could, you know, become sentient and, you know, it's a, you know, and, and you know, pull, hit the red button on the nuclear bomb. Um, I, you know, personally, I don't really think we need to be worried about, uh, about that as much. But I, his fight with Sam Altman is more, I think, you know, a, a personal vendettas. Paul, he kind of got he he kind of got uh, treated badly there. He thought or or pushed out, uh, and he's now and Sam he sees Sam Altman coming up, getting all this influence, um, and sort of disregarding the things that he's saying. So I think they I think they've got some personal beef. Uh, that's that's my read there. Um, I Elon Musk is definitely not a a true a true Luddite. I, I just don't think those things concern him on like the, on the day-to-day -day level. You know, he doesn't, he doesn't really care uh, about like conditions in his Tesla factory uh, as long as they're cranking out Teslas. Uh, right. that, uh, he's, he's more concerned about sort of the, the big picture and whatever makes him, you know, the most amount of money. That leads, I guess, a perfect segue to my next question, man, um, is I kind of want you to speak on, I mean, you know, studying in the industrial revolution and just, labor relations with ownership in general in a capitalist capitalist society i want to get your your thoughts on how um the the progress is 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 worth the rewards i mean mm -hmm. the, like risk versus rewards of automation of all of these things and how ownership via propaganda always somehow convinces people this is this is in your best interest and you've seen it from day one early on in the 1700s to today and how we continue to have people banging for billionaires on a day-to-day -day basis you still have elon stands uh all the amber jeff Bay, all these stands that just content because they have that carrot in front of them chasing that their one day is going to be you and it's not yeah. But like, can you can you speak to that that mindset of like, you know, I heard a great analogy one time. It was like, you know, an axe convincing a, a tree that it's one of them because it's made of wood. Like it, that that's a brilliant analogy. To, I think what goes on in the, in our economic structure. I I love I love that I love that analogy and I, I love this question because it's the answer is they've had to work at it from day one. So when the Luddites go to trial, uh, they go to the state goes to work. And they they immediately start you know calling these guys uh, you know depraved you know deluded rioters like how could they're 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 breaking the machines that that would that, that offer them employment how could they be so stupid they have to they have to go on a propaganda campaign from day one saying trying to convince the public that these luddites were were as we know them today because their propaganda campaign worked because we're still calling people who 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 don't like technology luddites or we're still we're still calling luddites anybody who says like well is, is this such a good idea to give amazon like all unlimited power over our, and, and they shut up luddite that's <laughs> it's still it's still in that framework and it, it's because of a concerted effort by the victors the very first factory owners who who won won the battles against the Luddite. Uh, we didn't quite get to it, but basically the state sort of 
sent soldiers right into the into the factories to work directly with the industrialists as mercenaries, basically. So they join forces. And you see this for maybe one of the first times to they start just shooting down Luddites as they start showing up to the factories. And that's when the the uprising gets gets the most violent. Uh, the the Luddites make a tactical error eventually, and they just they do they like they fight back and they assassinate uh, a capitalist um, in in cold blood, and that's kind of when they lose popular steam. Um, but the, you, it took that much. It took that union of the state and of industry and the crown at the time to sort of mount that counteroffensive that's what it took to beat back popular support they had to they had to print all these proclamations describing how how stupid the luddites were um and how backwards it was and then that combined with well look what happens if you fight back you get shot down you get you get gunned down in in you will end up in a pool of blood outside of a factory if you if you fight back with force and if you fight back peacefully we're just going to laugh at you so those are your choices and over the years, that basic attitude that to oppose technology is any to oppose the, the like a factory system, to oppose the, a system that allows a handful of again, we can we can call it oligarchs, basically, it's essentially that with all the power to decide how technology gets used who works for them under that those technological regimes to say that's a bad idea you get branded a luddite it's it has to be reinstilled generation after generation they have to say that there's a scholar theodore rozak he has a great quote it's like if if the luddites didn't exist then these guys would have to invent them because they need a boogeyman they need someone who that they can pretend doesn't understand the big picture doesn't get that, oh, down the line, there's going to be a million, there's going to be jobs, there's going to be prosperity for everyone. Well, it's been 200 years, and it always plays out the same way. The 1% fattens their pockets, and everybody else has to deal with, with shitty jobs, the day-to-day, -day, worrying about losing their jobs, worrying about losing their jobs to a machine. Bootstraps, it's baby. Pull them up. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> And so, so what I would say real quick to the other part of your question, which is that, oh, you know, eventually, yeah, we do catch up. We do figure out, well, guess what? Workers get together. They figure out how to, how to fight back, get a little bit more of the gains from technology, but it's after sometimes decades of suffering and immiseration getting fucked up in these factories. So it doesn't have to be that way. That's my like underline. It doesn't have to be that way. We can find a way to use AI that's cool that still gives working people their dignity and like lets them create cool shit and you know feed their families it doesn't have to be this way where we listen to whatever sam altman says and gives him all the power to do whatever he wants we can say we can say no to a lot of that stuff we really can so so along that line i'm gonna yeah. play devil's advocate theoretically please and just not not on what you said because you speak in my language i'm I'm with you. <laughs> but just from a cognitive dissonance standpoint, yeah. is there something technology gives, AI gives that you like, hey man, it's it might fuck with jobs, but god damn is it convenient. Is there something like that? Or are you are you losing a little bit of credibility if you admit that shit? <laughs> no, no, no. These things are not mutually exclusive. That's okay, the whole okay. point. Like I like yeah. like I you know, I don't care. I'll like I'll use you know, it, it once we once we get it figured out, I, I you know, we can all you we can all make AI Drake songs if that's what we want. <laughs> <do. laughs> you know, I don't care. Like, it's cool. Like, I, man, they you AI can write your cover letter and do like menial shit, like write emails. Do it. Do that. Especially stuff that's definitely not taking somebody's job like that. Like AI could do a pretty good job of like, you know, writing up your, you know, your your travel agenda if, in a city if you don't want to do a bunch of research or or sort of, yeah, write your write, write your resume or something because it can just pull from you that, that whatever that saves you a couple hours. That's cool. There's a lot of things that AI can do. Again, we just always got to be looking at like, OK, what's the context? who is going to benefit from this who's going to lose out uh and you know if we lived in a fairer society where it wasn't just a handful of vampires sort of sucking value out of everything that everybody else was doing then we could just we could all sort of be using ai all day long if we wanted to and it would wait be cool. there's nothing wrong create, with 
Yeah. Crazy idea. Is there a reality where AI just makes no one have to work and we just all chill and consume and just like sell our data as Fucking currency? Yes, like, is that a possibility? That's what like, I'm talking about, Billy. Communism, yeah. baby. Let's do it. Yeah. that I mean, AI communism kind of down. <laughs> if it's yeah. like the one like allocating for what you do. Yeah, fully automated luxury communism, right? Yeah, <laughs> I, I, you know what? Kind of down. <laughs> yeah, do well, I mean, again, we, it's always about the systems who holds the power. And there, there's a famous economist, uh, John Maynard Keynes, who who he made Keynes. this famous prediction about a hundred years ago, saying, given the rate of technological advancement and production, you know, we're all going to be working at most ten hours a week by like the year two thousand or something. Uh, it's, and he had, it's, it, it, it's a, I mean, he was a big deal. Like he was sort of like the economist of the day. He's still the guy that a lot of, uh, economists and, and policy wonks cite. And he really thought that looking at the way things were going, how much machines could create that pretty soon, like we would have an optional 10 hour work week if we just like wanted something to do. But it didn't work out that way because of the people who managed to capture all the gains instead of distributing it, distributing them into more equitably to everybody. It's just got concentrated more and more at the top. So it turns out to be more of a question of power and less of one of technology. Keynes was the reason I blew my first paycheck really fast. <laughs> Spend more, consume, save less. That's and right. When it was like, stimulate that economy. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> where's your Where's your savings? Keens, bro. I read it. <laughs> I love it, man. I love it. Uh, does, does anybody else have anything else? Because this is a great conversation, man. We kept it for about an hour, man. I, I know you got to get get things. Does anybody got anything else? Uh, I emptied the clip. Thank love you so it. much for coming on. Love it when Billy. Please come on again because we might need your consultation because we talk out of our ass on a lot of stuff we don't know about. <laughs> well, I'm <laughs> happy to. Do. This is this has been good fun, fellas. I, I love it. I do. Yeah. I, I do. Say one thing before you shake, man. Yeah. It's very trivial. I apologize. But has no. anybody ever told you you look like Chandler from Friends? Oh my God, man! I haven't heard that one since high school. People so used to call me that in high school. Right. Like, see it. It's <laughs> wild. You, you popped up on the screen. I was like, hey, yo. <laughs> they all look alike to you, Aaron. <laughs> I've been trying, I try to hide it with the long hair. It's not working, I guess. Yeah. Oh, it wasn't <laughs> just me. All right, but shout out to the high school. Well, unless they were bullies, then fuck them. Yeah, right. No, no, no. They were cool. That's cool all good. people. Then shout out to them. Yeah. Well, thank you for joining us, Brian. You can you can pick up his book. You can pre-order it right now. I actually pre-ordered it while we were talking, so I'm fascinated by it. Excited to read it. Blood in the Machine comes out September 26. I do kind of like Billy's vision of the future of just just chilling. Yeah. Just let the robots do all the work, and we just hang out all the time. Machines of love and grace, man. Let's do it. Robot, <laughs> bring me a course light. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they had a, what was it called? The, 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 chef, the, the food maker and the Star yeah. Trek Enterprise. You just say what you want, and they, bam, made it. Oh, just yeah. like that. Love it. All right, thank you. Brian Merchant, Blood in the Machine, September 26. Pick it up. I'm excited to read it. Thank you for talking Thanks. to us. All right, cheers, guys. Okay, takeaways from the Brian Merchant interview. Luddites uh, we, were kind of baller. Yeah. We need to destroy AI. We need to be the Luddites of today. You find it and kill it. Yeah. Yeah. We're going to go take back the, the word Luddite. We should. It's our word now. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I we're, like that. We're saying it again. We're saying it. Yeah. Hell yeah. The Luddites rocked. Um, maybe some people say maybe they went a little bit too far. I don't know. Maybe they didn't go far enough. Got their point across though. They did. Um, do you guys want to do some voicemails? Let's do some voicemails, guys. They're brought to you by Game Time, the exclusive ticketing partner of Barstool Sports. Big T, you went to a baseball game recently, right? Three this past weekend. How'd that go? Uh, the Braves went one and two, so not not up to our standard, but it was great because of Game Time. Yeah, and you met Matt Olson too. Yep. That was cool. Sick. Um, game Time is our official ticketing sponsor. It's created by fans for fans. They're the ticketing app that makes it easier than ever to score last minute deals on tickets to sports, concerts, and shows. They guarantee the lowest price. It's summer concert season. Lollapalooza was this last weekend. We've got Drake and 21 Savage, the Eagles, Chance the Rapper, SZA. We've got the Mets, Cubs, Yankees, White Sox, Dodgers, soccer. It's just all sorts of stuff going on this summer. The best way to get in is with Game Time. Everything's possible with the Game Time app. They've got the biggest last minute price drops on seats that you thought that you could never buy. The purchase process is two taps, 10 seconds, 
And once the once you buy your tickets, they're delivered directly to your phone, no printer needed. And if you have a family member who might be somewhat of a Luddite themselves, who is not savvy when it comes to using apps, things like that, it's super easy to transfer the tickets. You just text them. Anybody can do that. You can get into the game seamlessly, skip the hassle, enjoy the moment. Download the GameTime app or go to GameTime.co, enter your email, redeem code MACRO, get 20 bucks off your first purchase, some terms apply. GameTime.co, enter your email, redeem code MACRO. You can also do that on the app, promo code MACRO, 20 bucks off your first purchase, some terms do apply. All right, voicemails. Hey, what's up, guys? It's uh, Tom from Massachusetts. You guys are all gorgeous, um, both internally and, uh, and externally. Um, internally. My question is, I forget what the name of the movie was. It was books. Um, it was like Gold Compass or something. But everybody, Ooh, um, I know. like all the people have like little animal friends that like follow them around. Like some of them have like bears, like polar bears. Some people have, have like little birds that they kind of communicate with and talk with. They were kind of like, like they're like bonded in a way. I don't know. Um, you know, I know Arian just hates all animals, so you probably wouldn't want anything. But, um, <laughs> but yeah, I just wondering what, uh, what animals everybody in the squad would want. Um, also just need to know when that next album from Arian is coming out. Um, other than that, guys, I hope you have a good one. And, uh, yeah, look forward. It's a good question. So it's a great question. I, you, I'm actually I'm going to text Aaron. He had to run out. It's his daughter's birthday. Happy birthday to her. I'm going to ask him when the next album's coming out, though, so that guy can get an answer. So he's talking about Damons, they're called, uh, in the in the book, and it's really cool because basically they can transform. Um, before they set in a certain animal, and it was one of my favorite books, but. I don't think you can have a polar bear as a daemon. I think that's the only rule. That's the one that you can't? Yeah. Why not? Because there's a bunch of armored polar bears in Svalbard, and they aren't daemons. Totally. Okay, so... It's, but, it's, it's a long But story. what's your answer to the question, Billy? I feel like this is a good question for you. What, what small version of an animal would you want following you around? I wish I could have a polar bear. I'm going to break some rules and say polar bear. Okay. Wait, so these are miniature versions of larger animals? Is it, Did I hear that correctly? Yeah. No, they can be large animals too. Oh, so just so like, it's just animals. Just just a bro, a bro animal. Okay. Yeah. Because it'd be sick to have like a mini lion, like yeah. a lion the size of a chihuahua. That would be sick. That'd be awesome. Or you can get a cat. No, that's not the same thing. I think I would go tiger over lion. Okay. I like the stripes. Um, or like a little tiny hippo. That'd be cute. Like the size of this. You know what I would want? Like, what if you had a giant bee? Uh, absolutely not. Where the fuck did you come up with that a horrible idea? A giant That's bee, terrifying. a single hornet. What is wrong with you? Well, if you had a giant bee and it was yours, it wouldn't fuck with you. But nobody is going to mess with you if you had like a bee on a le like a bee the size of um, be on a leash, yeah, a be on a leash, freak on you a had leash, a bee on a leash. And it's the size of, let's say the uh, sign behind you. Yeah. Or, or, um, just like a normal, a lab, like a yellow lab. Yeah. It's horrifying. And you had a, yeah, exactly. Nobody would ever fuck with you. All it takes is one. You forget lunchtime and that thing's going to be pissed at you. No, no. My bee, my bee would be my boy. And it, you could, since it flies, you could sneak attack people with it. And you could just buzz past people. Imagine how terrifying that would be. I'm going with the original misinterpretation that you had, and I want a small hippo. Okay, that's cute. There's You actually can't have a polar bear, but it just can't be a Ponzer Bjorn. Okay, thank you for clarifying. Which okay, is the ones yeah, with yeah, armor. Totally. Also, I, I'm getting flashbacks from that book, and there's like it's really fucked up. I'm wondering, like they like... Like the worst thing is getting sliced away from your daemon. Spoiler from a book ten years ago, and like there's a bunch of evil people doing it, and like that's really fun. I would up. want a tiny Billy football that would just follow me around everywhere, and then I just lift so much more weight than it would get, just be pissed off all the time. That's what I would want. Uh, Mad Dog McKenzie, you guys have an answer. The hippo's a good one 
from Big T, but I don't want to like steal that. Maybe like a like a giraffe. Okay. That's like my size or a little bit bigger, so I could almost like ride it. Maybe. Polar bear is a good one, or I would just say like regular bear, just yeah. like a bear. Brown bear. Yeah. Brother bear. Yeah. Yeah. Or a horse. They have those. <laughs> Get one of those. Uh, And the answer to the question about the next album, Arian's got an album coming out next. He says next year, (laughs) brudda. So there you go. Looking forward to that. Bobby Fino returns. All right. One more. Yep. Hey, this is Arian from Wisconsin. And my question is, if you had a two-way door in your home um, that went anywhere in the world, you could come and go as you please, where would that be? Um, mine would probably be the Caribbean or somewhere warm um, with good food because we don't have those things in Wisconsin. Um, let me know what you think. Love you guys. Stay handsome. Stay beautiful. Stay gorgeous. Times Square Yard House. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say Vegas. Just the city? You end up in Vegas? The so It goes directly to the street. Memphis Bass Pro Shop Pyramid. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> It's a great spot. Great spot. Wonderful hotel there. Um, yeah, it would probably either be that or um, Fort Knox would be a good one too. Oh, that's a good call. The yeah. interior of Fort Knox. Profitable. Just go read up. Yeah, just re up. But you know, there's no real gold in there, right? What do you mean? The gold's fake. Is This is another diehard movie, I think. No, no, the gold's fake. They they took all the gold and just pretend it's in there. Are you Are you serious? Yeah. Have you looked at the videos of them in the gold safe? I think this is. I like have not looked news. at those videos. There had to be a congressional committee to go check that the gold's real. And what did they find out? They're like, the f- at least the first couple bars were real, but they don't know if the ones farther back are real. So, they don't know if it's just this, concrete. This, so you just said that there is gold in Fort Knox. Yeah, there is gold, but they maybe not as much gold <laughs> as they say there is. Did, did I just completely miss here the last no, 45 it, seconds it, of my life? This is just. No, no, but like they, like, we really don't know if the gold in there well, is real. Wh- how, what would prove it to you, Billy, if they let you in there? I They need to test every single bar of gold. Why? Because they, someone might have said, Billy logic, has questions. We can't prove that anything's real. <laughs> well, after, during the Great Depression, they bought up all the gold. This is just a conspiracy that I've heard. Yeah, okay, that may- but it's fun to think about. You were just saying it as a complete fact. I know, because I'm podcasting. Okay, got it. <laughs> totally. Got it. Um, that would be that would kind of rock, though, if there actually wasn't any gold and we just said that we had the most. Yeah, that's like, it's, it's literally the Wizard of Oz. Yeah. All right, I like where your head's at, Billy. You just presented that in a strange way. Um, all right. Well, good voicemails, guys. Well, Matt, Doug, McKenzie, you guys have an answer? Mm. I would say like probably like a beach like her too, like Outer Banks, North Carolina. Yeah. <laughs> I, I always used to go there. I love the Outer Banks. I don't want to sound like it. I don't know. Like maybe my parents' house so I could like see my dog whenever. Oh, that's actually a really good one. Is that a good one? That's. I don't know. That seems like the most limited mindset thing of all time. That's a good dog owner, though. It is a good dog owner. Yeah. yeah. That's true. And to see my parents, but mainly to see my dog whenever I want. But that would just be like, you can still go see your parents. That's true. I know, but I can't. I don't have a car. I have, I, I Anywhere in the car. world, you could okay, just walk okay. into. I don't know. What's oh, your favorite? my favorite college bar. My favorite college bar. Okay. You are thinking very small, limited <laughs> mindset right now. You guys know I'm bad I at think this stuff. I don't know. Oh, a Taylor Swift concert. Yeah. Whatever whatever stadium That's Taylor not Swift a place. Is. SoFi Stadium I think, today. I don't know. I don't know. Vegas. I I think it's the I don't best. think Vegas. I don't I don't fuck with Vegas like that. You could also just go to Vegas. It's not that far away. <laughs> yeah, but you could just walk onto the strip. Like think about all the dining opportunities. The, that's that's why you'd want to go? Yeah, what? Is for the dining opportunities? <laughs> yeah. You live in the city with like the best restaurants in the world. Right, but do they it's expensive. So is Vegas. The buffets in Vegas they the Vegas food isn't as expensive as New York. So city. you're saying like the buffet at the win. Yeah. Okay. So Billy might be a secret well, genius because I 
I don't like the idea of him using Vegas so that he could just be in Vegas whenever he wanted. What Billy's really onto is the ability to walk back through that door and be home from Vegas in half a second. Yes. That's the best part. The best part about Vegas is leaving Vegas. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Well, uh, that will do it for us this week on macrodosing. We're going to be back on Tuesday. I'll do a full recap of Donnie's vi- wedding slash my extreme Irish vacation that I'm going on for 40, 40 hours. Enjoy. Thank you. I will. I'm, gonna, I'm tracking down a kilt. I'm hot. I'm hot on the trail of a kilt. And we will see you guys then for nanodosing and then Thursday for macrodosing. All right. Love you guys. Mm-hmm.